In search of a record high, live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Vonnie Quinn. We're kicking you off to the closing bell right here in the United States. And as you can see, we've already hit an intraday high on the S&P 500. It was a great day for Michael Hartnett's team at Bank of America to come out and talk about how the Magnificent Seven and all of the narratives of last year still count this year so far. And look at it, at least for today, it's true. That intraday high, 48.30.42. Right now we're at 48.32. So we've actually surpassed that. We have a new intraday high right now. As you can see, we are seeing some of the air coming out of that March rate cut balloon again today with the two-year yield in particular up another five basis points. It's crude oil stabilizing, not too many headlines coming out of the Middle East, but for now we are still above $73 a barrel. And the Golden Dragon Index is interesting. We're going to be talking about this throughout the show. The amount of money that's come out of China, in particular China and Hong Kong, over the last several weeks is really quite stunning. This index, a proxy for China and mainland and Hong Kong stocks down 16% so far this year, another three quarters of a percent today. All right, but of course we go back to the S&P 500. It's been 515 days since we last had a record high on the benchmark U.S. index, a reclamation of that high, 47.96, spot 56 to be precise. Not only in sight, but we're trading firmly above it at the moment. Last week, the S&P did trade above that level on two separate days, but this is the first time in two years, though, uh, that apparently we are going to close at that level. Today is as good as any another day to take a run at that record high. And when you look at that level where we're at right now, now at 48.32, it is a somewhat lackadaisical and a somewhat lumbering rally that has taken us there with more than half the S&P stock still in the red on the day, on the week and on the year. So while the gains this week may not, may not really be sort of those animal spirits that Steve Schwartzman over at Blackstone was talking about the other day, I'm sure a lot of investors are perfectly happy taking what they're getting here right now. You can thank a slew of economic data this week for putting a floor under equity prices. That includes the economic data that showed resiliency in retail sales, resiliency in the labor market, and just this morning, fresh data showing resiliency in consumers' optimism about their financial situation. That UMISH sentiment number coming in as its biggest monthly uh, increase that we've seen going back to 2005 as the perception of current financial situations rose to a two-year high and consumer short-term expectations for inflation, Bonnie, slipped to a three-year low. And we have it in chart form right here, Romain. As you can see, you mentioned that rise, that monthly rise being the most since 2005. That's nearly 20 years. You can see that rise right here, a stunning rise in the last month's data. And as you can see, we're right back to 2021 levels when it comes to consumer confidence. One month's data obviously comes with all the caveats that one month's data comes with. But this is an important input, the 2.9% for short-term inflation expectations. Does that complicate the Fed's job? What kind of conversations will they be having around that? This mostly thanks to gas prices and also the stock market rise last year. Well, that's going to continue if the data continues. It's a self-reinforcing cycle, right? If we flip up the board, and while we're doing it, I point out that Neil Dada also making the point today that this will weigh on the November elections, right? Especially when it comes to the incumbent. It depends on how people feel about the economy, how they feel about the incumbent president. So that could be good for the Biden administration. Certainly today they're enjoying the data. This is a chart form of the expectations and current sentiment. And as you can see, we are higher on both to a large degree. And uh, this mostly thanks to households being, you know, also employed as well. Don't forget that our employment data is still very, very strong, Romain. All right, kicking off to the close, let's get right to it. Rebecca Patterson joining us here in Studio 2, former Bridgewater Associates Chief Investment Strategist. And Rebecca, I'm sure you've been keeping an eye on the economic data. Economic data that is painting, if not a rosy picture, certainly one that's not as dour as I think some folks had priced in a little a few weeks ago. No, absolutely. Whether it's jobless claims, retail sales, confidence, the things you mentioned earlier, all better than expected expected this week. We did have some really poor manufacturing sentiment data this week, but it seems like the market doesn't care so much about that. Manufacturing's been contracting for over a year. What we care about is the consumer. That's the bulk of what drives the U.S. economy, and the mm. consumer remains resilient. Those sentiment numbers were quite alarming, I mean, in a good way, uh, in the idea that, you know, what had been really an inflation-driven drop in sentiment now appears to be a disinflation, I guess, bump up in sentiment. Exactly. Yeah. So as inflation comes yeah. down and wage growth continues, even though at a slower pace, 
real disposable incomes go up. So what you want to see with the consumer is the ability to spend and the confidence to spend. And this week we got both, right? The ability to spend because jobless claims are still low and the confidence in that University of Michigan survey. And, and digging into that report this morning, I noticed that Democrats and Republicans yes. were more confident this yeah. month. I was like, oh, that's and, new. And that's interesting <laughs> because you remember the past reports, there was yes. that divide there and you kind of wonder. Still a divide, but they were both happier. As, yeah, they're, both they're both happier. happier. I know. There's what? hope for this nation after all. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean for the Federal Reserve though? We're already obviously seeing, as I said, the air come out of the March rate cut balloon. Does this sort of solidify that? Well, to the degree stocks keep going up, and if 10-year yields and bonds in general yields come down, easier financial conditions will be one factor that could slow them down. Um, the resilient consumer, I don't think that slows them down unless they think it could restart inflation expectations or restart higher wage inflation. If the consumer is so strong, too strong, right? So we need that Goldilocks consumer. And right now it feels like that's where we are. But there are risks both ways. To your point, if the consumer's too strong, you could see inflation go back up again. That's going to put the Fed on pause for longer. And there are still risks to the downside for the consumer. We got the latest business confidence for the service sector out recently. The employment piece of that had a huge drop for the last month. It didn't get a lot of coverage on, on, in the media, but it was interesting. When we've seen drops like that historically, it has always been into a recession. So I don't think we're out of the woods yet, but these are certainly good data to suggest mm -hmm. the soft landing prospects are still alive and well. well. And also we're not an isolated economy, right? And there are still things going on elsewhere in the world. Today it seems pretty quiet, but there have been serious geopolitical headlines over the last Absolutely. couple of weeks. Absolutely. I mean, freight rates are going up very, very quickly. That's going to be stagflationary, right? It's going to be harder to get our goods and we're going to pay more for them. That's going to be something that could make the Fed ease more slowly, but also hurt growth. Um, the geopolitical risk. It's not just the Middle East and Ukraine. Now we're seeing North Korea making some noises that I think one has to keep an eye on as well. The Taiwan Strait, of course, continues to be something we have to watch carefully. Plus, you just have much slower growth in China. And I think we're going to see slower growth in Europe this year. All those things are going to fold into the U.S. economy. And we've seen that play out certainly in Chinese equities uh, over in, uh, in Hong Kong as well as in mainland. But I am curious also about probably one of the more important or I guess more stellar turnarounds we've seen in markets over the last a few months and that's what we've been seeing in Japan of course the Nikkei still holding at what the highest level since 1990s uh, and really just a lot more I guess optimism about the longer term investment prospects so it doesn't necessarily seem like this is short term track tactical trades that these are people making a longer term bet that uh, I guess what has ailed Japan for so long may finally be behind it. Yeah, I think there are some structural things changing in Japan. They've been pushed, I think, for a few years now to increase return on equity in Japanese companies. But it feels like there are some signs they're doing it. If you look at buybacks from Japan, for example, they've been up now for the last three years very strongly, and there's still so much cash on corporate balance sheets there. It represents about a quarter of market cap. Mm -hmm. To put that in context, the U.S., it's seven. Yeah. So we have much less cash. So they have the funds to do more buybacks. That's yeah. going to support the market. And then if we could get Japanese households to increase their exposure to local stocks even a little bit, that would be a major well, push. Just real quickly, we're almost out of time, but this was Ted Pick. We had an interview with Ted Pick uh, and mm -hmm. Morgan Stanley uh, or out of Davos and he kind of touched on this point how they're really looking to expand in Japan and he talked about this idea of sort of this potential unleashing uh, of households there and where they put their money. We haven't seen it yeah. yet it, but the prospects are better today than they've been in decades literally. Yeah. They have rising wages um, the economy is truly reflating. Mm -hmm. So if it's going to happen, this is when it should happen. And if it doesn't, to me, that suggests maybe there's some more vulnerability to this rally. Maybe not in the very short term, but as we look further out over this year into next. All right, Rebecca, going to have to leave it there. Always smart. Rebecca Patterson, former Bridgewater Associates, chief investment strategist, helping us kick off to the close. We're going to continue our conversation here about what's going on in markets, including a closer look at some of the comments out of Sam Altman over at OpenAI, looking to raise billions for the next step in his path to total, total AI dominance. Details up next. Plus, our next guest says residential real estate sales are set to pick up this year. We'll get a master plan from David O'Reilly, CEO of real estate giant Howard Hughes Holdings. And an upgrade for AT&T after major improvements to his network. We're going to talk to the analyst behind that call and why he sees a brighter future for T. That's coming up next right here on The Close. This is Bloomberg.
Life and Liberty's Freedom 100 Emerging Markets Index is completing its annual rebalance, making the top four countries in the index, Taiwan, South Korea, Chile, and Poland, all places that have seen an influx of geopolitical risk. Now, while that may seem scary, our next guest says there are still opportunities for investment. Joining us to talk a little bit more about this is Perth Toll. She's the founder of the Life and Liberty Index. It's Perth, great to have you back on the program. It's been far too long here. Uh, taking a look at that list, I see South Korea makes sense to me. I guess Chile sort of makes sense to me. I do want to start, though, with Taiwan, because, of course, that has been in focus given the elections and, of course, given some of the concerns that still persist out there about its relationship with mainland China and whether China will, will like to change and alter that relationship. Why do you find it attractive in this state? Yeah, so as you know, Romaine, um, we've been on together at the beginning of the launch of our fund. Um, this index basically weights countries based on their freedom levels. And Taiwan is the highest freedom score uh, country in the emerging market space. So in that emerging markets universe of about 24 countries, Taiwan scores the highest on both personal and economic freedom in that composite score. So we look for countries that have strong institutions that, that provide checks and balances, strong rule of law, and strong protections for, for both personal and economic freedoms. And especially in the emerging markets where you're coming from a low base, we believe that is where we'll find the best growth story, uh, stories in the future. Mm -hmm. Now with Taiwan, we were very concerned coming into 2024, into this election, uh, because we saw that the aggression from China, um, all of our clients um, were very cognizant of this. And so our investors know though that as, as we saw with Russia and Ukraine, uh, the aggressor, usually the autocracy, is the place where the autocracy risk lies. Mm -hmm. So in you know, the war with Russia and Ukraine, the right. worldwide sanctions on Russia and then the fall of their stock market uh, is what we're looking at here as a potential risk for China if there's to be a war of some okay. kind. So I personally, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's an external risk. And so I get that, that maybe, okay, I, if their internal measures are enough to sort of rise to your threshold. One of the other names that was at the top of that list, though, was Poland. And there were political risks there, but those political risks were sort of coming from inside the house, so to speak here. What changed the ga that gave you a little bit more confidence that that got bumped up in the index? Yeah, so Poland has been um, under a government that had constitutional majority for the last eight years. And this government was kind of a more extremist, more far right wing, and rolled back or attempted to roll back some freedoms such as judicial independence. Now we see the EU coming in as a balancing party, um, a balancing institution to um, stop that from happening, and they've done so successfully, but more so, we saw voters, Polish voters turn out for the most historic, the biggest turnout in history in their October elections to vote the uh, other side into power, so that now there's a balance of powers in Poland. But we're gonna see some volatility while the two, you know, the prime minister is from a different party than the president right now, and that's gonna be, throughout 2024 into 2025. So we will see some volatility, but I have never been more bullish on countries like Poland hmm. um, in the emerging market space. Because of this historic kind of turnout in this election, I see the checks and balances working. I see institutions are strong. Yeah. And I see even a more of a checks and balances coming from the EU. Mm. So I, I, I've never been actually more bullish on these types of smaller countries in the emerging market space that are, have high freedom levels. Perth, markets don't always respond well to freedom and democracy though, right? Particularly emerging markets. I'm thinking if you put, say, India across from South Korea, you'll see very divergent performances. And, you know, according to your indices, there really shouldn't be. How do you account for that? Yeah, so democracy is uh, not the goal here. Freedom is the goal. But democracy, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a way to get to the, the freedom. So it's the best government type that we have that leads us to the freedoms that lay the foundations for economic growth and innovation. So we still want those countries that are democracies. You know, India is a, is a very old and very large democracy. Um, notably, right now, it is not in our index because India is having some issues as well with exactly. media freedom with um, repression of Kashmir peoples, with you know, blacking out of internet in places that are to have protests. You know, there are a lot of issues um, like that. However, I do have 
you know, very bullish views on India as well, even though it's not currently in the index, it's very borderline and could make it in at any time, mm -hmm. um, at any rebalance, I should say. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the, it's, it's, there's no 100% free country. There's no 100% repressive country, you know? So yeah. it's all kind of relative and we just want to capture the, the most free, the best opportunities out there. All right, a conversation we need to continue. I'll have to leave it there for now. Perth will catch up again soon, I'm sure. Perth Toll, the founder of Life and Liberty Index, is a rebalance here. One of those main indexes now pushing Taiwan, South Korea, Chile, and Poland to the top of the list. Coming up here after the break, a discussion about OpenAI and its CEO, Sam Altman, and, well, his push into getting into the chip business. It's a big one. That's coming up next after the close, out on the close, here on Bloomberg. Welcome back. A Bloomberg scoop. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman has been working to raise billions for a chip venture with the aim to set up a network of factories to make AI semiconductors. Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow joining us right now with a little bit more on this story. What is exactly the ambition here? I mean, why not just rely on, I guess, the existing uh, network of foundries and other things that are out there scattered across the globe? Because we've learned in the last few years, particularly in the aftermath of, of the pandemic in 2020, that there are vulnerabilities in the chip supply chain. The ultimate goal for Sam Altman and OpenAI, according to sources, is to have certainty of supply for AI chips specifically, accelerators that are used right now in the training of large language models. But the inference part of the equation is really important. And, and what I'm understanding is that, that Sam Altman's very concerned about this, that in the future, he needs to make a move to guarantee that supply. And how that's looking right now is that he is in talks with many different types of investors to raise tens of billions of dollars and then go to the, the existing fabs or the existing chip contract manufacturers and work out a way to build out that supply base, which is not straightforward. Yeah, Ed, you're reporting that firms including Abu Dhabi based G42 and also SoftBank might be interested. Now SoftBank obviously has some experience here, Masasan bringing the ARM IPO to the table in fact, but it was very costly. Is it likely that they would want to invest in something like this? That These things take a long time. Yes, yeah, so what I'd say on G42 we previously reported that the firm wanted to give Sam between eight to ten billion dollars. We reported that at the end of last year. Um, and, and you know, it's important to note that at least in DC there have been concerned about G42's association with Chinese entities and calls for greater scrutiny on them. My sources are telling me that SoftBank are very much in the fray. And th 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 there's one thing is clear is that Sam Altman holds all the cards here. SoftBank is a very willing investor, and trust me, there are many others that would go to Sam Altman and say, here's many billions of dollars. But my understanding is he's holding his cards very close to his chest and working out strategically yeah. the best place to get those funds so that he can move forward with what is a complicated project. And we should point out, he's probably not alone here in the ambitions, Ed. Another scoop on the Bloomberg terminal, also in the AI space, this having to do uh, with some folks over at uh, yeah. Google's DeepMind project and some scientists there, at least two, who have are said to be leaving to start their own venture. What do we know about that? Yeah, so two long-standing computer scientists at Google DeepMind. It, look, it's not hugely surprising. People do leave their jobs in the AI industry and go to other places. If you look at some of the leaders in the field, many of them are OpenAI alumni and have gone elsewhere. Equally, many people at OpenAI have worked at Google DeepMind. These two scientists are raising 200 million euros, we understand from sources, which for a debut round is very big. That was a story in 2023. Think about France's Mistral, for example, mm. which raised in excess of 100 million dollars for its first ever round. Th these are new levels that we're seeing with seed and series A rounds and it just shows the kind of investor interest yeah. but also the capital you needed to get started from a talent perspective, compute perspective, mm. if you're going to build your own AI company. Ed, thank you so much. That is Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow.
Time now for Options Insight and we want to get you up to speed with the day's options trading. Abigail Doolittle is looking at some option plays on commodities including gold. I understand Abigail. Indeed we have one of the best gold bugs out there. Gold traders I should say. Vani joining us today for Options Insight. I'm very pleased to say that Dennis Gartman the former editor of the Gartman Letter and the current chairman of the University of Akron's Endowment Fund. Thanks so much for joining us Dennis and it's been quite a ride uh, for gold uh, recently and even over the last few years. Talk to us about what you're seeing at this point. I think gold wants to break out to the upside. We shall see. Time shall tell. But uh, the trend has been for, for several years from the lower left to the upper right. We've had, uh, for lack of a better term, a quadruple top in gold around 230 to 230, 2030 to 2035. We got there th four years ago. We got there three years ago. We got there a year ago. We're there again right now. And I think we're about to break out through 2035 and spot gold. If that's if that happens, the place to take a look at is owning GLD, the ETF, or owning GLD's options. You can own the 195 G GLD options for February at about 70 to 75 cents. You can own the Marches for about a dollar 50 cents. And I think if we break uh, spot gold above 2035 and take a GLD, the ETF, above 195 on a weekly basis, weekly closing basis, I think we go to 230 or 240 very quickly in GLD, which would be a, a huge run. So. I'm very, I've been bullish of gold for a while. Gold has uh, obviously geopolitical circumstances predicated upon it, and also it, it would be beneficial if the Fed were to begin easing monetary policy. Uh, that would be a, a, a bump to the gold market at the same time. So you've got geopolitics and interest rate considerations. I say buy GLD if we break above 195, if gold closes above 2035 on a weekly basis, and buy the options, the 195 calls for February or March. If they work, you can go out to May and June later on. Well, you beat me to it because I was going to ask you why you thought gold would be going higher, but you certainly answered that. But you're not just taking a look at gold. I know that you think that Bitcoin is the new gold and that it's a speculative tool, but let's skip right ahead to uh, oil and even wheat because uh, you have some thoughts on those commodities uh, as well and how to play them through options. I've been bearish on crude for a while until about the last week and a half or two weeks predicated upon the fact that the term structure, which is where the where I've always said informed, sophisticated money leaves its footprints, and we've taken the, the term structure from a contango in crude oil to, to a, a small inversion, which I think is very bullish for the crude oil market. So for the first time in months, I'm actually turning bullish of, of crude. I think buying crude at uh, buying March futures at, at the right at the current spot price. I think we're going to start to see 80 to 85 dollars again in the not too distant future. It depends on what happens in the Suez Canal, what happens in the Indian Ocean. But uh, I think uh, crude stopped going down. The term structure has turned quite bullish, and, and term structure has always been again where informed money leaves its uh, its footprints, and informed money is leaving its footprints on the bullish uh, phenomenon right now. Well, that is a tremendous perspective for sure, and I know that you also think that contrary to what some people think, that snow for winter wheat uh, is actually bullish for those crops. Thank you so much, Dennis Gartman, former editor of the Gartman Letter and chair of the University of Athens Endowment Fund, for joining us for Options Insight today. From New York, this is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close, just about 2.30 here in New York, and that rally in equities now accelerating into the close with the S&P firmly up more than a percent in record territory, the Nasdaq up about one and a half percent here on the day. Meanwhile, a mixed bag going on right now in the commodity space. Let's get right to Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by with our commodities close. Yeah, indeed. And overall, we have the Bloomberg Commodity Index down. So in contrast to uh, what's happening for stocks and the big weight here, uh, crude oil and the energy complex in general, you can see crude oil down uh, almost nine tenths of one percent, cooling off after some of the gains. More recently, heating oil futures, despite the cold in the U.S. and other elsewhere, uh, also taking a break from the recent rally. To the upside, though, we do have have uh, crude palm oil and we also have sugar higher. Sugar is up 2.3 percent. So lots of strength for some of the, let's say, oddball commodities. Uh, but again, oil that is overall weighing on that Bloomberg Commodity Index remain. All right. I like that. Oddball commodities. <laughs> Abigail do a little there with a nice wrap up of what's going on in the commodity space as we turn our attention right now back to real estate. We got some economic data this morning that showed sales of previously owned U.S. homes falling in December, capping the worst year for the housing market in nearly three decades. 
David O'Reilly is the CEO of Howard Hughes Holdings, which owns, manages, and develops commercial, residential, and mixed-use real estate throughout the U.S. here. David, great to have you here on the program. Uh, I should, we should point out, I mean, you guys are kind of like the experts, the kind of master planning communities here. And there's so many moving parts in that, because you're not only just talking about what the demand is going to be for those homes, but also, of course, for the retail businesses that would serve some of those people, as well as the offices and, and other sort of commercial businesses where some of these people may work. Has that planning gotten harder in this environment than, say, a few years ago prior to the pandemic? No, I don't know that it's gotten harder. I'd say that it constantly evolves and that every six months we have to look at our master plans and make sure that we're developing the products that our consumers are looking for that helps create these amazing places to live, work, play, learn and discover. Uh, you know, four or five years ago, we would have said need less retail because malls were challenged today, need less office. But we still need some, and we're still building to meet that demand that we see in our communities. There's been a lot of talk about just how weak the housing market was last year, particularly when it comes to existing homes. However, we saw, of course, a big rally in home builders. We saw a big rally in, the, in those folks who are associated with the new home build side of the equation. And I'm wondering if the strength that we're seeing in new home builds or the demand for new home builds is coming at the expense of what we're seeing in the existing home sales market. Well, I don't want to say it's at the expense, but I think you, you led this segment by highlighting that it's been the worst year for existing home sales in over 20 years. To me, that's a sign of positivity for home builders and for land developers like Howard Hughes, because it means that the supply of uh, available inventory has reached one of the lowest levels in multiple decades. Demand is still there, albeit at slightly lower levels given today's higher mortgage rates. But with more demand and less supply, pricing power firmly in the hand of home builders, and those home builders are paying record prices per acre for Howard Hughes land. We're doing that because of this imbalance that exists. Those that have existing homes with mortgage rates that are on average in the mid threes aren't willing to sell their home to trade into a much higher mortgage rate, whether it's 6% or 8% today. That's put all the leverage in the hands of new home construction and public home builders. David, I know at least last year you were struggling at certain points with the financing market that was freezing up just a little bit because of concerns mm -hmm. about commercial real estate. Now, you did get your Woodlands project off on, you know, onto a good footing, but it was difficult to begin with. Has that improved at all, that situation? I think it's stabilized. Uh, I would tell you that there are still loans available for some of the best borrowers, for some of the best projects. But those projects that are on the edges or those projects that are in a property type that are out of favor today, like office are still incredibly challenging to get. Uh, we've had incredible success getting loans recently, specifically on a new condo construction project in Hawaii. And where a condo construction project used to be one of the harder deals to get done, today they're the easiest on a construction basis because the lender knows what your takeout is. Those condos are pre-sold at a certain price and they know they're getting paid back. So in, from that regard, those loans have become a little bit easier Whereas getting a, a construction loan today for an office building is incredibly difficult. David, I know that, you know, prices are going up in places like Texas. So Dallas and Houston, where you're quite active, obviously places like New York, you mentioned Hawaii. Where will the next places be that prices go up? Look, I, I think that we're going to continue to see increased demand outside of Las Vegas in a community like Summerlin, where we own outside of Phoenix, because they're warmer, less expensive and affordable. Uh, the income to afford a median priced home outside of Las Vegas or outside of Phoenix is one third of that in San Francisco, less than half of what it would take in New York or L.A. And as a result, we're going to continue to see that flight to quality of life, that flight to affordability that those communities continue to offer. Do you think that that flight will be followed, of course, by the jobs and other support that are needed? I mean, there's a reason why cities like San Francisco, New York, et cetera, became the behemoths that there were. A lot of us live here, not because we love the place per se, but because, you know, if you want to make a living in a certain industry, you kind of have to be here. Absolutely. And we're seeing a lot of those corporate relocations every day, every quarter. We've signed a number of deals with uh, cryptocurrency companies, uh, cosmetic companies that have moved their headquarters out of New York and San Diego, respectively, into the woodlands just north of Houston. And we're already in discussions with a number of CEOs today that are thinking about moving their business to Summerlin outside of Las Vegas. Those companies, CEOs like myself, we have to bring our businesses to where the well-educated workforce is. And that well-educated workforce has left places like New York and San Francisco, 
and gone to chase quality of life. And now companies are chasing that well-educated workforce. All right, uh, David, uh, great to uh, have you here and very illuminating. David O'Reilly, he's the CEO of Howard Hughes Holdings. And Bonnie, uh, we don't always talk about this company, but I mean, they are really a behemoth in this space. And I'm always fascinated by the whole master planning aspect of this business because it's way more complicated to do that than just say, we're just going to go out, buy a tract and build, you know, a dozen homes on this track, but to really sort of ha integrate where the jobs are going to come from, where the retail support is going to come from, et cetera. There's a lot of moving parts that you have to do. Exactly. And yeah. it's very much a, sort of a distant prospect when you start planning these things, right? You have to think about well, how things are going to change in the next 10 to 20 years. And those kinds of long time horizons are so difficult. But the seaport in New York is one of uh, the Howard Hughes yeah, developments. Yeah. And that's really coming Well, up that's the it. other thing, too. I mean, we always talk about them kind of in these suburban areas, but they have a big presence, obviously, here uh, in New York. And I, I didn't love I, New York. Huh? I don't believe that you that you. The, I didn't say I didn't love New York. I'm just saying, you know, some of us have to make choices that aren't about what we love. You were a little about hinting about it a little bit. Yeah, all right. I know you're a lover of New York, right? I'm a complete yeah. lover of New York. All right. All right, still ahead, AT&T spent time and money upgrading its wireless network. Now Oppenheimer says those efforts are paying off. We'll talk to the analyst that raised his rating on the stock next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Chegg. Goldman downgrading the company to sell from neutral. The firm saying the ed tech sector is under threat from that boogeyman of artificial intelligence. Says that the rise of AI may alter learner behavior and ultimately user growth for Chegg. They also see fewer subscribers amid intensifying competition in the space. Price target being trimmed as well, down to eight from 10 bucks. The share is being trimmed down 5% on the day. Next up, IBM, an upgrade to outperform from inline over at Evercore with the analysts calling it a quote, overlooked beneficiary of the adoption of artificial intelligence. Yeah, they believe IBM's unique set of consulting and software assets will help cons customers deploy AI's vast set of tools in a much better way. Those shares getting a nice boost today, up about 3%. And finally, let's take a look at AT&T, an upgrade to outperform over at Oppenheimer. Now, the analysts there are citing improvements to AT&T's network capacity and coverage, all giving a potential boost to average revenue per user. The analysts also excited by the potential of that merge to merge their satellite provider, DirecTV, with DISH. AT&T shares having a pretty decent day, up about 2%. And those are some of our top calls. And we do want to stick with that last call and talk to, well, that mythical analyst that we just mentioned. He's here live in the flesh. Tim Horan, cloud and commu communications analyst over at Oppenheimer, is the man behind that call. Uh, Tim, talk to us a little bit more about this, specifically when it comes to the average uh, revenue per user. Sure, uh, Ramin. So at and has invested $50 billion in their 5G wireless network over the last three years. And frankly, the whole wireless industry has. And they want to get a return on that investment. Um, and one way to do that is to take advantage of a massive amount of increase in capacity, uh, increase in quality, uh, increase in speeds. Uh, so they're giving customers what we call more capacity on hotspots. They're also now starting to sell fixed wireless. They're starting to sell some enterprise new business use cases on these brand new 5G wireless networks. And they're slowly raising prices and kind of encouraging uh, their subscribers to move up to these higher price plans. Well, well, that's what I'm curious about, too. Uh, so does the growth story, meaning the revenue story, become one of basically just getting more money out of the existing subscriber base? Or do you anticipate that you could see new subscribers come into the fold? Uh, great question. We do have new revenues coming from Internet of Things and things like Apple Watches. Uh, but we are uh, only growing the postpaid phone sub base around 2 3% per year. That's not going to really accelerate it that much. We're basically you know, reaching saturation. So we kind of do need uh, new use cases and more usage. So, you know, to your question, the industry is kind of growing revenues three, four percent. More than half of that is uh, from encouraging existing users to spend more money. Tim, it looks like sentiment, though, is fairly split. We have 16 buys and 16 holds. What do you think other analysts are valuing this company at that may be slightly less attractive than your valuations of, for example, 15% free cash flow and 7% dividend yield? 
I'm not really sure, but I mean, it's they've had a difficult three, four years. They they sold off. They got out of the media business. They had to sell a lot of spectrum. They raised a lot of debt. They haven't been able to deleverage all that much. And a lot of people looking for assets with more growth. But we're kind of focused on the fact that they have a 15 percent free cash flow yield. And we think they're at a place right now where they can return that free cash flow to shareholders. Um, that's going to be a balance. They're going to reduce their debt from $130 billion down to $110. Um, and then we think at that point they're going to start to buy back stock. But we think in the short term people are missing the fact that they do have massive amounts of wireless capacity that they can monetize. But even on their wireline side, they've been building out a lot of fiber uh, already. And they are attracting a lot of new broadband customers on the fiber side. And those customers are charging them a lot more and raising prices there. So. I think a lot of people are taking a backward uh, look at AT&T and not looking forward to where we're going to be three years from now. Yeah. I mean, the other thing you draw attention to is this potential to merge DirecTV with DISH. Is there any movement in that direction at all or any speak, any talk of this? Uh, it's been a talk for a long time. Um, the two companies have worked together a little bit where DISH does resell AT&T's wireless network. They were talking about maybe doing joint builds for the wireless networks. I think DISH needs to clean up some of the spectrum that they own um, and some of the business model. And I, I think there's a very, very high likelihood that the two companies will figure out ways to merge the satellite business, the TV business, and then come up with a way to come up with a better product for those customers. We think um, bundling in fixed wireless in particular with a, a direct broadcast satellite product could be a very, very fine business. Um, it's just that uh, it's going to take time to bring this together, but hard to know on the timing, but we do think it would create a lot of value, frankly, for both companies if they can figure out how to work together, and we think they ultimately will. I am curious about uh, kind of how connected uh, companies like AT&T are uh, to the hardware makers in terms of their reliance on upgrade cycles and the like here. There's been a lot of talk, of course, about uh, the new uh, the, the new iPhone whenever that comes out later this year, but also, of course, the release uh, uh, today or the orders have been starting to be taken for the, the new VR headset that Apple is out here. Is that a material thing that they that you have to sort of pay attention to and that AT&T has to pay attention to? Uh, yes, primarily because in the United States they provide a lot of phone subsidies uh, for their customers, and for AT&T, you know, this can cost them well over five billion dollars a year in subsidies for customers. And what's happened with the phones lately is they've gotten a lot better, and we've not seen a lot of new upgrades. Uh, so the phones are lasting an awful lot longer. They can last like four or five years now. They used to last two or three years. So. Net net um, for AT and T, it's important because they're reducing their expenses quite a bit, and it's one of the things that's really helping out on the free cash flow growth. Now, you also like to see new devices like like the headset and like you know Apple watches, and there's a, a whole host of new IoT devices coming out. AT and T is very dominant, for example, in the connected car business. Yeah, and their whole alternative business outside of just phones is kind of over 20 percent of revenue now, and it is growing faster than the overall business, and that probably should should continue. But to your point, we need new hardware. We need better hardware to take advantage of these wireless networks. All right, Tim. Uh, great stuff. Uh, Tim Moran there. He's the cloud and communications analyst over at Oppenheimer. An upgrade on AT&T to outperform a $21 price target here on the back of what looks like maybe some potential revenue gains here uh, as well uh, as that potential combination of DISH and DirecTV. All right, still ahead here. Why are parents it's here in the U.S. not saving as much? There's been a lot of discussion here about the cost of child care and how it dives into household expenses overall. That conversation after the break. This is Bloomberg. Child care now because it's no secret that parents in the United States are facing record high prices for care and it turns out it's preventing many from saving for the future. According to a new survey from care.com, more than a third of parents who pay for child care are drawing down their savings to shoulder the costs. Joining us is Bloomberg Equality reporter Kelsey Butler. That's kind of a terrifying statistic that they're drawing down their savings. I mean, I guess put it into context for us, what kinds of costs is childcare bestowing upon parents these days? 
Yeah, I think some people that aren't actually making these payments would be surprised, but on average in the U.S., for a nanny, it's about $40,000 a year. And if um, you think, you know, that's a luxury service, of course it's going to be expensive. Daycare costs aren't necessarily easy to swallow either. On average, those will run you about $17,000 a year. So still a pretty penny, and uh, parents are tapping into their savings. They're spending less in order to make that math work. I am curious, though, why people are surprised by that number. I know it sounds like a big thing, but anyone who has kids is kind of like, well, like, you know, no, <laughs> you know, no, whatever, Sherlock. Yeah. I guess what I'm not allowed to say it on air here. But why are people surprised by it? And does that sort of feed into the problem that if people aren't aware of this cost, uh, that there's really no way to really address it? Yeah, I think obviously for parents, yeah. uh, there's no sticker shock there. It's yeah. a pain point, but we we understand what's happening. But I think what we're really seeing is how much prices have risen in recent years. Bank of America Institute data shows that prices are up 32% just from 2019. Mm. That's not that long ago. So yeah. though childcare costs have always been a pain point, they've really risen exponentially recently. And it's a necessity. I mean, it's not like a discretionary item where you can just cut back on it. Yeah, it's infrastructure. Yeah. For most yeah. people, yeah, exactly. Well, not if you love it. Yeah, you have to love it. I mean, <laughs> you have to let it take care of itself otherwise, right? But how do parents make that calculation that remains talking about? Because at some point it's more cost efficient for one of the parents to work at home basically as, as a child care provider than to go out to work. And we are seeing parents and families having to make the, that calculation. The same uh, Bank of America Institute data showed that we're seeing a decline in the number of dual income um, households. So some parents are stepping out of the workforce. Uh, the care.com data also showed people are making decisions like cutting back on work hours just to um, make the scheduling work. And anecdotally, I've heard people doing all kinds of creative things like working from home while also taking care of their kids or working opposite shifts in order to um, just keep things going and make it work. When you look at the study and you look at that data, is there any sense or any hope, I should say, that those prices at a minimum will stop rising, but more importantly, any hope that they'll actually come down? I uh, hate to be a pessimist, but I, we're not seeing that on the horizon right now. We saw an end to pandemic era funding for child, the child care industry in September, and um, that is going to likely make centers close. And in the meantime, in order to make the math work, again, those centers are going to have to hike prices in order to retain staff. Well, you never want the choice to have children or not have children to be a cost issue, right? That's the saddest thing in the world, but it is all the time for so many different reasons. But is it more cost efficient to have more? Does it become cheaper the more you have in terms of at least care? Well, I don't know about that. When you look at the discounts, you're seeing maybe 10% knocked off of a price at a daycare center, and we're talking about things in the very high thousands of dollars. That's not really making necessarily much of a difference. Wow. All right, uh, Kelsey, uh, Kelsey Butler here, uh, who helps the leader of Bloomberg Equality Coverage. A uh, great look here at some of the data behind the costs uh, to raise a child, and more importantly, I guess some of the folks who still have their head in the sand about uh, what that cost can be. Well, and it's fascinating yeah. because we're seeing so many countries try to promote the having of children, right? So yeah. many countries are faced with this dilemma of demographics and, you know, their populations getting older but not being able to replace them with new people. And, you know, you've certain countries actually offering cash. It yeah. may not be enough. And in the United States, yeah. obviously, it's not enough. Well, it'll be interesting to see if it's addressed. I mean, how many economists have we heard from prominent economists who've made it clear the direct link between economic conditions and the cost of child care? If you don't address that issue, you're basically shutting out a huge portion of our workforce, but I think of the potential workforce. Your point is right, though, yeah. Romaine. I mean, when you have a kid, you have to be thinking of these things, right? It doesn't just start at school age yeah. when you have to pay school fees. It starts the minute that they're born. I mean, yeah. they're costly little beggars, right? Yeah, don't tell me. <laughs> um, but we love them. We love them all. Uh, mostly. Um, all right, let's get back uh, to the markets here as we count you down to the closing bells here on this Friday afternoon, a holiday shortened week that started off with the whimper. Looks like it's going to end with the bang. 4,835 and change right now on the S&P 500. If it holds that level, that would be a record high, Bonnie. Absolutely, it would, Romaine, and we are also going to keep an eye on yields as well because that will also tell the tale to a certain extent. You've got the two-year yield there at 4.1398, and yeah. oil has been relatively quiet actually today in the commodity space. We did see a really rough week for natural gas. I'm sure you noticed yeah. down another six percent on the front month contract today. You take a look at Bitcoin there now, back around that 42,000 level after, of course, a few interesting days coming off of the approval of that spot Bitcoin ETF last week here. Maybe 
maybe get in a bit of its mojo back here. Some of the big individual movers out there on the day. Take a look at Celsius Holdings. That's the energy drink maker. Having an awful day. A lot to cover, a lot to break down. Stick with us. Romaine Bostic and Bonnie Quinn. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Bonnie Quinn. And Bonnie Quinn, it looks like it's going to be a record day for the S&P 500, barring a huge reversal uh, over the next uh, hour here. But with one hour to go, we're firmly in record territory, 48.37 and change right now on an S&P that's really just kind of been lumbering its way towards that record high. But a big surge in activity and more importantly, a big surge in volume as we get closer to those bells. Lumbering its way is a lovely way of putting it, Romaine, because it did. It took a while for it to pick up speed, right? And there's been no sort of huge catalyst in the meantime, but as you say, we keep going higher. Yeah, maybe the economic data is giving people a little bit more confidence. You see the Philadelphia Semiconductor has really been leading the charge here, at least for a second day, up about 4% here. Yields not as much of a factor here on the day. But I want to flip up the board here because I've been keeping an eye on what's going on overseas. We should point out the U.S. isn't the best performing market. The best performing major market for quite some time has really been Japan. Yep. And there's some interesting anecdotes saying that some of that has come at the expense of China. Uh, the latest Bank of America fund manager survey talked about this idea here of how so many traders are looking to pour any money they can into anywhere but China. So we're basically talking about emerging markets or non-U.S. markets, as you say. So it's going into India. It's going into other places, including a non-emerging market, but going into Japan as well. And of course, you know, there's a great sort of consensus that April is the time when the BOJ is going to make its move. And so it would, you know, be sort of the obvious thing to do, at least until then, perhaps to park your money in yeah. Japan. But it's had a great run so far. It's up something like 20 percent in the past year, Romain. So yeah. is it time, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, here. Uh, well, there's a lot of uh, individual stories, too. We talk about chip stocks leading the charge. I know you've been taking a look at some other stocks as well. Yeah, I specifically didn't look at the chip stocks because mm -hmm. they can take care of themselves, right? Michael Hartnett of Bank of America coming out today with his note saying, look, it's the same as last year. But take a look at the top mover right now. It's Travelers up more than 6% for that company, and that's going to have a halo effect on some of the other insurers. Core EPS beat, that was the main story, but it's also maintaining its quarterly dividend, and that's sending, as I said, all its insurance peers higher with the exception of one and that's a lot in today's session we'll see next week some more earnings from insurers if that all bears out and then moving to you're taking the Schlumberger yeah what's yeah. going on there isn't it fascinating Romain because obviously Schlumberger was a huge story last year with oil field drilling yeah. really sort of doing well well today this is a dividend growth story it's giving back a little bit all those gains yeah and I mean well but that's what a lot of these companies are supposed to do well, right I mean that's why that's energy is attractive we, I feel like we've gotten away from that as well you had Albemarle up there as well I thought and they're down on the day that was the down story mm -hmm. we're going to be speaking about electric vehicles a little bit later on well this is directly associated with that kind of story it's lithium lithium miner and they have not been doing well they've been cutting they've been cutting expenses they've been cutting projects they've been cutting people but lithium prices are just in the toilet down 80 percent mm -hmm. from their peak and albemarle yeah. is really suffering down the toilet is that a technical term for lithium yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm fascinated by this because we're going to talk a little bit later here about uh, some of the bloom coming off the rows of the ev boom and of course it's companies like albemarle that supply one of the key chemicals uh, for that uh, really uh, suffering here we are moving closer to these closing bells we have our full cross-platform coverage of all today's top stories right now. Countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Bonnie Quinn. We're joined right now by our colleagues Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and our partnership with those folks streaming on YouTube. And for anyone that was betting here on a potential rally in this market, you finally got it. Up a percent here on the S&P 500, Carol Masser. Yeah. And if that holds, that will be a record high. Yeah, big time, right? All in. It's interesting to see that. We're getting ready right for the Fed blackout period. We've got 
a little bit of time to go for that first Fed meeting. Having said that, you know, that consumer sentiment report this morning showed that consumers are out there. I kind of feel like it really um, goes together with the retail sales number we got for the end of the year. Like people are out <coughs> shopping, they're feeling, are you okay? Uh, no, but go ahead. <laughs> you know, maybe it's time for you to take a bit of a detox. Here, let me, a detox? Stop smoking So I shouldn't drinking. drink this vodka? What? Yes, and put your phone mm. down. I don't know if you saw this. Siggy's is that with a challenge yeah. uh, to people to basically, right, Tim, do <clears throat> a digital detox. Yeah, for 10,000. Wait, 000. who? Yeah, Siggy's, Siggy's, they make the yogurt, right? The yogurt, the yogurt yeah, maker. Yeah. And they're doing a digital detox? Yeah, so it's it's obviously a promotion for Siggy's. Sorry, but they're I need calling it a different kind <clears throat> of dry January. Stop okay, it. so you know dry January when you don't drink alcohol. What about a dry January? January about giving up your electronic device. So mm -hmm. they're doing this contest where you can uh, win $10,000 in three months of Siggy's yogurt if you put your phone in a lockbox for an entire month. You can still have access to a phone. They'll send you a flip phone and a SIM card, but that smartphone, it's got to get <laughs> uh, under lock and key. That seems very complicated. 10,000 bucks. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think I could. Could you do it, Bonnie? Bonnie do you think you could, could you do, do it? it? I could do it. You, if you paid me ten thousand, I might exactly. do it. But I'm not going to do it for a competition. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, if I they gave me ten thousand up front, maybe. Yeah. No, they know that they will. They will. You have to enter to be one of the people who you know gets the ten thousand dollars, or if you make it to the end of the month, you get the ten thousand. Only ten people get it, though, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Cheap marketing. <laughs> exactly. Under grand. Boy, you guys are such naysayers, man. No, I, you know, I, I guess I mean, maybe we're naysayers but it, here. But I, I wasn't aware to of that this. Bigger point of like how much time we're on our phone? Five and a half hours a day for the average. Yeah, I mean, there's a power. there's a longer Low conversation power. we can have about this, but there's also the issue of necessity as well here. I mean, I, I don't know. That's I fair. mean, I know you may spend all your day, Carol Master, playing video games on your phone, but some of us use it for productivity. I mean, we're made you know, of day trading. To be better at our jobs, to be you know connected to our kids and our family. Where do you buy all your dapper? Um, you know how you you look so dapper. Where do you buy your clothes? Is it online? Mm, no, I have a guy in Baltimore. <laughs> can you? Um, me so, to... All right, where do you want to go? I, uh, I was looking at another story here, too, though. Uh, you know, we, Vani and I were talking here on Bloomberg Television a while ago about the downdraft that we've seen in mm -hmm. Albemarle, big stock of uh, uh, lithium, uh, making lithium. And a lot of this is tied to the weakness that we're seeing in the EV space. Yeah. Remember, there's been so much commentary right now here uh, that that rise in demand has now basically flip-flopped. And, of course, we learned a little bit earlier today that Ford, uh, f uh, kind of confirming what we all knew, really scaling back now its EV uh, it's F-150 Lightning uh, vehicle production. Yeah, it's fascinating because they're going to one shift, and one shift in an auto production facility is really almost nothing, right? But they are upping their shifts in the regular combustion engine type trucks. So it is fascinating to see that people are just going off EVs. It's not just the F-150 EVs. UBS out with a yeah. forecast for 11% growth this year. So but growth, is, but not much. I, I wonder, though, if this is kind of an own goal kind of situation. I mean, for, aside from the fact that, you know, they price these things at obscene prices. Uh, but then there's the whole issue of infrastructure and a lot of the other things that you need to support this. And it just really wasn't there. I, I feel like maybe they came a little bit too fast and furious, if you will, pun intended, I, Carol Masser. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, good. it depends on everyone's <laughs> different you. in terms you, of the Bonnie. way the I way like that Bonnie. they, you know, Can't use their hear. vehicle. But a lot of people in the U.S. live in single family homes and, and have garages and can charge these things at home. So from an infrastructure perspective, there are a lot of people who don't necessarily need to be charging these things when I, they're on the road. I'll leave you with a stat on that, Tim, to okay. push back. More than half the country lives in multifamily properties. In including the only thing I will <laughs> say, I think you guys talked with Keith Naughton. We're going to, too. And I know we've got to run. But Keith Naughton said the growth is there it's just at a slower rate so people are still yes. buying yeah, them it's point. just you know so yeah, yeah I, I mean no one's saying timing. that the EV boom is over it's just that yeah the, the, the fast growth rate is in there I yeah. agree with you do, do you own a V EV car not I yet not. The pri I agree with yeah. you the prices no. have been crazy yeah no got an old-fashioned gas car oh okay yeah I got a horse the environment thanks remember you. we talked about age earlier this week <laughs> no <laughs> Goodbye. I'm out of here before we all get yelled at. All right, guys, we'll be back in less than an hour's time. We're going to wrap up the trading week, the trading day, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We will see you at 4 p.m. Wall Street time for Beyond the Bell. And we continue our markets coverage right here on the close. Counting it down to the close, those closing bells just 50 minutes away. Mimi Duff joining us, senior client advisor over at GenTrust, to talk a little bit more about this market. And you join us, I guess, on a pretty good day, at least if you're a bullish type. Uh, we are sitting at record high levels for the S&P 500. And this has kind of been a long time in the making. We've seen this coming. It's been a slow march higher. And I do wonder if you feel that that march higher has been justified. 
Yeah, I think the initial uh, roots of the March higher really stem from the improvements in the inflation data that we have veritably seen over the last three to six months. And, and then in, the, in December, the Fed really took a pivot and started talking about um, likely that we're at, at or near the peak funds, right, which the next step will be when do they start easing. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, we do think that, that um, you know, the expectations are pretty lofty at this point for earnings growth this year. Mm -hmm. So we're a bit more cautious than, uh, than the market excitement yeah. on these big days. I, I am curious. I, I mean, I just take and you can correct me if this is wrong, but you guys are still underweight equities, overweight fixed income. What, if anything, would get you to flip flop that? And I mean, in the shorter term, so like you say, over the next year or so. Yeah, so I, I was afraid you were going to say in the next week when you said the shorter <laughs> term. Um, listen, uh, we we think that the fixed income just performs better in a broader range of scenarios. If we if the economy does uh, falter and begin to weaken, we'll see those bond yields um, go down further. And on the flip side, if uh, if growth continues to be okay then uh, you can earn the yield. We do think that, you know, rates will stabilize here. What causes us to change? Um, likely, if we were to see the earnings growth materialize, that is priced in something like 11 percent um, this year and 24 is priced in. And also, if, if growth were to remain high in the face called two, two and a half percent in the face of continuing falling inflation, I think that would put us in a in a more optimistic outlook. Mimi, will the Fed have been just a little bit concerned looking at today's data at all? I mean, everything is coming in so strong. Does it suggest at all that the Fed will have to do something a bit more drastic at some point? You know, maybe uh, maybe hold for longer, but then need a 50 basis point cut or some something like that? Yeah, so it's interesting because the Fed, uh, in their last summary of economic projections, has three cuts penciled in, and the market has six pe cuts penciled in for this year. So I think on the margin, the Fed should be more cautious and, and wait longer. Right now, we've got 50 percent odds of a cut priced in for March, and our baseline, for instance, is they should, they should collect more data before they start cutting. So we're probably on the lower side, unless they as you point out, unless things get sloppy, then we could see an acceleration of rate cuts. When are we going to see some pain in the labor market? Any pain in the labor market? Well, you know, the labor market's been steaming along, but it really has, you know, the, the monthly job growth numbers really have come down quite a bit. And on the labor force on the supply side, we have seen growth in the supply side, right? Like working aged women's participation in the labor force is at an all time high. So uh, I think it's just we're going to have to wait and see. Typically, the Fed doesn't really ease with inflation above two and a half percent unless the unemployment rate's been above 5%, and we're at 3 and 3.7 right now, right? So that the labor market has been a rosy element thus far. All right, Mimi, thank you so much for joining us. That is Mimi Duff, Senior Client Advisor over at GenTrust. Coming up here at an interview with Centerview Partners co-founder Blair Efron. His views on M&A and much, much more. And a lot of talk about that slump in M&A. We're going to actually break down one specific sector, and that's the gaming industry. We're going to talk to Josh Chapman over at Convoy Ventures. And just over a week out from the launch of spot Bitcoin ETFs, David Mann, head of ETF products and capital markets over at Franklin Templeton, joins to talk flows. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Less than 45 minutes until we get to the closing bell. Sitting right now at record highs on the S&P 500. That's largely due to the fact that you have names like Meta Platforms sitting near record highs. Microsoft at record highs. In fact, a lot of the big cap tech stocks now posting up towards some of their highest levels that we've seen, if not of all time, certainly in the last few years. A little bit of red on the screen here. Netflix and Tesla, one of the few laggards when it comes to the Magnificent Seven space. But 
doesn't matter here. Everyone else is doing their job. Magnificent 7 as a whole up about 1.7%. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index up more than 3% here on the day, almost 4%. And the S&P 500, which we've been talking about all day long, 48.39 and change, 1.2% gain on the day. If that holds, that would be the first record high for the S&P 500 since January of 2022. As for the rest of the space here, keep an eye on what's going on in the commodity sector because what's happening in equities and what's happening in commodities, not necessarily telling the same story. A big week next week, Bonnie. We've got about 70 companies in the S&P 500 scheduled to report, including some of the big and most consequential ones, and that includes names like Netflix. Exactly, Romain. And also some banks as well. Let's recap bank earnings and talk the broader financial sector with Sol Martinez now, Senior Analyst of Financials at HSBC. So let's start on your call on Discover Financial, Sol. You downgraded the stock to hold from buy. Tell us about some of the trends you're seeing in loan growth. It's a really, really difficult quarter for Discover. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it was a, it was a surprising quarter. Um, and you know, the, the, we did downgrade them yesterday to a hold from a buy on the back of the results, and, and we reduced our estimates, our EPS estimate, for 2024 by 8 percent and 25 by 15 percent. Now, the, the primary reason for that is that the loan growth outlook has really, really changed. Uh, loan, they're primarily a credit card issuer and uh, grew the loan, total loan book 15 percent. They're expecting 0 percent loan growth this year. So it's a dramatic change and a dramatic deceleration. And at the same time, they're really surprised on the outlook for credit costs mm. and for net charge offs. 3.4% going to, to uh, uh, 49 to 5.2% expectation for next year. So they are expecting credit worsening and they're seeing it, the 30 day delinquency ratio. And, you know, and, and they called out some trends that um, you know, are challenging for them. You know, they, they called out that, you know, their borrowers are seeing uh, the effects of, of wage, real wage reductions because inflation has exceeded uh, wage, uh, wage growth. Um, they've depleted savings. Uh, so, and, and keep in mind that this isn't an environment where un the unemployment rate is 3.7 percent. Yeah. So it does raise some questions, yeah. and we just think the, the best thing to do here is, uh, you know, take some money off the table and, and go to a hold rating. How murky is the outlook, Sol? Because it is quite difficult to see. I mean, yeah. already the year is surprising us, right? Even though the narratives are similar to last year so far with the stock market, at least. Yeah, I mean, look, I think we're broadly, you know, put aside Discover a little a bit. Um, the big takeaway thus far is that we still have a challenging and an uncertain revenue environment. Mm -hmm. Loan growth is, is, is still very subdued for the big banks. They're still seeing deposit cost pressure at a slower rate, so it's, it, that, that's positive, but they're still seeing that. They're still seeing outflows out of checking accounts into higher yielding instruments. And the guidance for net interest income, which is the biggest revenue component for traditional banks, for the banks that I cover, you know, 24 down low single digits to high single digits. Now, where there is some difference of opinion, and this is really important, is when you see a bottom in net interest income. And that's really important because the story for big banks can't just be about things getting worse at a slower rate and then being cheap. At this point, you start, you do need to see improvement. You need to see things get better. You need to see revenue start to accelerate. And there's a difference of opinion in, in terms of when that happens. JP Morgan still sees net interest income pressure throughout the entirety of 2024. Right. And, but others, and we're in this camp, see that inflecting in the middle part of 2024 and in the back end, you start to see sequential growth. Um, but we're still a little bit away from that. So. So, but, but when we talk about that growth story, do we also need to talk about the potential for an increase in capital requirements and other yeah. regulations? I mean, that's been sort of the, uh, the, 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 the sword of Damocles that's been hanging over them. And yeah. I know there are some analysts who think that the banks will deal with it fine. But when you hear some of the proposals coming out of Washington, I don't know, some of these look pretty extreme. I agree. Um, the, the proposal would increase for the biggest U.S. bank capital requirements by 20 percent. That's a big number that clearly would have an impact on risk taping, risk yeah. appetite and buybacks. Now, we're actually a little bit more positive here. We do think the industry's advocacy efforts are working. Mm -hmm. um, and your very excellent Bloomberg intelligence analyst, Nathan, Nathan Dean, puts a 60% probability that the final rule, um, you know, which should come out sometime this year, the exact timing is, is, is hard to determine, um, will we'll soften that. We agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, we think the, the final rule will be uh, uh, softened versus what we have today. And I actually think that's positive because I think we priced in a lot of that 
uh, last year. And if that's the case, it does open the door for, for some banks to start to buy back stock. And somebody like a city who can buy back their stock at 50% of book value, that's a big positive. Wow. All right, Saul, this is uh, great stuff here. We've got to get you back on. A nice name drop yeah. with Nathan. He's one of our favorites, too, yeah. as well. <laughs> uh, Saul Martinez over at HSBC. A closer look here at some of the bank and financial earnings that we've gotten, almost through that part uh, of the earnings season, uh, Bonnie Quinn. But we should uh, kind of take a moment here mm. to kind of talk about the potential end of an era here. A big friend of the show and a quite legend on Wall Street, Dick Beauvais, we're learning, is going to retire. He's 83 years old, so, you know, maybe it's time for that. But he's had a remarkable career that has spanned more than five decades. Uh, ODN Capital Analyst departure is effective today. He said this in a call from Florida. Beauvais is leaving the industry to spend more time with his wife and said he would consider taking on consulting projects at a future time. He was so fun over the years, you know, through really, really difficult times. We spoke to Dick Beauvais during the financial crisis mm -hmm. constantly, and things were coming out constantly, and he always was yeah. able to, you know, analyze in real time and give his time yeah. and help us analyze in real time what exactly was going on with the banks, yeah. some of whom didn't even make it through. And that was, you know what, nearly 20 years ago? Yeah, and always appreciated his candor uh, and just humor. And you just you know, talk about a guy who just knows every corner of Wall Street from his days at Dean Winter, Rockdale, and all the sort of... Uh, the companies he worked for, they got bought by other banks, and of course he ended up uh, over at Odeon Capital. So great career and a well-deserved uh, retirement. Seven years analyzing yeah. the banks. It's all, it's all ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, a lot more. I don't know if I have that kind of all right, a lot more coming up here on the close. We'll be back in a moment. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. The most read story on the Bloomberg terminal today is not about the Fed, it's not about stocks, bonds, or anything else. It's about chicken fingers. More importantly, the billionaire owner of the chicken finger chain raising canes, Todd Graves. Apparently, he's purchased a penthouse at a luxury condo building under construction in Dallas. And this is significant, I'm told, by our producer because the wealth that has really gravitated, not to Texas overall, but specifically Dallas, and the way that it's really boosted that real estate market, as well as like the restaurants and other things out there, has been remarkable here. Uh, a 20, I don't know how much, how much did he pay for this thing? Something like 25, 25 well, we million. No, but yeah. it has to be at least. At least like 25 million. million, because another penthouse in that building went for 25 million. Yeah, but you know how these deals get done as well, yeah. I mean, right? And no one wants to have an empty penthouse apartment and so on. So, you know, I, I yeah. would like to see the Oh, contract. yeah, yeah, I can totally <laughs> relate. But that said, you know, it does speak to the fact that Houston, Dallas, all these Texas cities have become massive, massive growth centers. And it gets to the conversation we were having a little bit earlier with David O'Reilly at Howard Hughes, the idea that there are some serious uh, demographic changes going on right now where people are finding that they can live and work in other cities other than the, the traditional major hubs like in New York or Los Angeles, Chicago. And of course, we know Texas has been a big beneficiary of that, whether well, it's Austin, Houston, or Dallas. Exactly. And the tax yeah. situation beneficial yeah. as well in uh, Texas. Have you ever had any raising canes? Because this is his... Uh... Uh, no, I don't. But I just was looking it up in the right. break. Apparently, they've got a couple right here in Manhattan. So uh, I think we've got uh, three minutes in the next break. So maybe we can rush out a... and get some chicken fingers here. <laughs> All that more coming up next right here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Less than 30 minutes to go here, Bonnie, with stocks right now at record highs. And it was and um, is a phenomenal day in the stock market. Let's have a look at the IMAP because the S&P 500, as we know, has been hitting intraday highs. Will it close at a record? We shall see. At least right now, it's making a very big effort to do just that with all of the sectors in the S&P 500, almost the whole pie green, except for consumer staples. So interesting. That's really just Estee Lauder and Kenview and no particular news there. It's just that consumer staples are probably the least favored right now. Michael Hartnett of the Bank of America with a note saying, listen, last year's themes continue to be this year's themes. He also thinks that the negative themes, the people selling banks and so on, that that will continue too. All right. 74% of those individual stocks are higher here on the day. And that's a big flip-flop from what we saw this morning. In fact, the S&P 500 was in the green, but you had the majority of the stocks were in the red. That's changed as we're getting closer to the close 
closing bell. And we're now not only sitting at record highs for the S&P 500, but for a lot of individual stocks. That includes Microsoft, which is poised to close at a record high. And take a look at Supermicro, a 35% gain on the day. That's the most on record and at 422 and change. That would be a record high as well. They came out with preliminary earnings. They report full earnings on the 29th, but those preliminary results cause a lot of optimism out there. And remember, this is on the back of those results we got out of Taiwan Semi earlier in the week here. So at least when it comes to the chip and more importantly, the hardware sector in the computer space here, there's a lot of optimism there. And that's what really drove the rally today and yesterday. Meanwhile, to the downside, two interesting stories. Enphase, that's actually the most volatile stock in the S&P 500 over the last 30 days. And it's actually one of the biggest decliners on a percent basis since the start of the year. And iRobot, a 25 percent drop. As we learned, apparently the European regulators are prepared to block that acquisition by Amazon of iRobot. Bonnie. Well, remain for more market analysis. Let's bring in Dana Diori now, co-CIO and president of Investnet Solutions at Investnet, which currently has $375 billion in assets under management. So, Dana, were we all wrong? Is, uh, is the Magnificent Seven not fully valued? Is there more to go? <laughs> well, it seems like there's always more to go. Thank you for having me, Bonnie. Romain, I, I, I would say to you that after spending a year of, of telling everyone, hey, button up that portfolio, you can't just be concentrated in the Magnificent Seven, uh, you know, and here we are. Um, we had in December, obviously, some widening, very much breath uh, coming in, you know, small caps doing well after uh, not, not performing very well throughout the course of the year. Sectors that were just getting hammered, all of a sudden catching a bid. In fact, a lot of the performance uh, last year that we got out of the small cap market was in December. So, you know, it looked like we were getting a lot of good market breath. Uh, but here we are in a rally, and it's kind of the same winners that we were seeing last year. So I would say it's it's one of these cases where if you're in the market, your you know retail clients, which is what we serve, uh, be our advisor base. It's really about just making sure that the portfolio is broad enough, and that you're not overly concentrated, and not have this sort of barbell that we were sort of seeing, where you know S and P 500 and big cash positions to take advantage of you know, cash rates, we, we, we recommend and like to see more diversification across the stream, right? Small caps, international, et cetera. Well, so if you've been in cash and you're trying to get in on some of this action, you know, it's very confusing time, particularly with the Fed. We don't know whether March is out of the picture now. 50% of the market says that it's not out of the picture yet. And obviously also with these run-ups that we've seen, what do you do with your cash? Yeah, well, so first I would say if you were in cash last year, it, it seemed like a nice place to be, right? And, and we saw money markets increasing dramatically. But then you look at what happened in, you know, returns in the market in the S&P 500, and you kind of missed a, a fantastic year, right? So whereas it might have felt great to lock in those cash rates, hey, for the portion of the portfolio that belongs in cash, it stay in cash. But to your point, if you're, if you're looking for places to be in the market, chances are you've got all already a 2007 in your portfolio. You've got a ton of tech and growth in your portfolio, whether you're indexed or your closet indexed. So I would say and recommend broaden out that base. If you're tilting, maybe tilt a little bit more to a diversified small cap portfolio. Maybe consider alternatives. There are so many options now in the market and much more access, I think, in the past than you've ever seen before, yeah. where you're really kind of diversifying. When you're looking at valuations and you're sort of trying to find spots in the market specifically, are there areas that you find attractive on that basis of valuation alone? Yeah, um, well, something, for example, like healthcare utilities that just got completely hammered. Again, you know, these areas of the market that could not catch a bid. Healthcare, we know, too, um, tends during election years to struggle, uh, you know, and either way, right? Wh whoever you think might uh, make it into office, um, there's reasons to, to consider a struggle. But to your point, when valuations are low enough, you've priced in all the potential bad news, it actually is a nice place to be. Even if you're looking at the growth story and you're saying, um, I have some concerns about election year drama, uh, you know, the, the valuations are, are beaten down so far that it is worth getting into. And I think looking at areas of the market like that, if you've been out of those areas, getting back in. But I'll say again and stress it, uh, small caps are a good bid, I think, in general, right? We know that over the long haul, unless you're in those growthiest small cap companies, you do tend to outperform um, good style factor exposure in small caps, you know, value it. Uh, quality. Those are a nice place to be in small caps. So I definitely recommend looking there as well. Uh, does that also become, though, the economic story? Uh, do you need to basically see more
more of the data points like we've gotten over the past week showing resiliency in the consumer, resiliency in the labor market, et cetera? I think there's a short term and a long term picture to this. Short term, I think the reason that you've seen better improvement in performance lately is because of Fed pivot. Small caps tend to be more interest rate sensitive. So it wasn't as much of a problem and you saw them doing a little bit better. Now there's, you know, well, is the market actually over promising on, you know, what the what the Fed's actually going to do? To your point earlier, um, you know, this expectation of a rate cut in March, maybe that doesn't materialize. Maybe we don't get 140 basis points of cuts. Maybe it's something more like 75. Does that in turn in the short run hurt small caps in the same way it helped them, you know, when, when all those rate decreases got priced in? I think maybe in the short run to a certain extent. But again, back to the valuations, valuations on small caps are still favorable relative to large caps. We go into the year at 19 times for the large cap, right, um, mm -hmm. whereas small cap is on the average. So I, I still think for a mid or longer term play, which most investors kind of should be, it, it's a good bet. Dana, you have on some of your picks the ARK Innovation ETF, Arc Innovation ETF, the Sector Spider yeah. Biotech ETF, and also the Regional Banking ETF. You'd want to be pretty courageous to put any kind of significant portion of your portfolio in any of these, though, right? Yeah, no. I mean, I would say to you that, you know, you, what you're talking about there is um, situations where the, if it's a risk on environment, you start to catch a bid for some of that stuff. Um, but again, that, you know, if you're going into specific sectors like that or, or even subsectors, uh, areas of the market, industries in the market, that is more in my mind of a speculative play. And you're really doing it based on, again, the, the idea that valuations are low. Um, you're not doing that in a big piece of the portfolio. Dana, thank you so much for joining. That is Dana Dioria, co CIO and president of Invest Solutions at Investnet. Coming up, the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Some breaking news right now on Sherry Redstone and her family company, National Amusements. We're now learning that Apollo Global Management is considering making an offer to buy National Amusements from the Redstone family company uh, that controls the film and, and TV giant Paramount Global. Of course, we know Sherry Redstone has been uh, shopping around if at least some of that company, if not all of it. Uh, we are learning that several bids uh, have actually come in, and now we're learning that Apollo Global Management, according to people familiar with the discussions, is considering making and an offer itself for national amusements. All right, we're going to try to get you some more details on that story, and we will return to it once we get those details. But now we want to turn to our top three. We do this every day where we dive into three of the big people at the center of three of the big stories out there. And we're going to start off here, uh, Vani, with actor Alec Baldwin. He was just indicted again on charges of involuntary manslaughter in the onset death of cinematographer on the set of that movie Rust. This was out in Santa Fe. Of course, the incident happened back in 2021. Of course, this made all uh, the media. It was a big deal here. A previous grand jury decided not to move forward with the case, but now apparently, according to the Associated Press, there's been a new analysis of the gun that was used. And now special prosecutors in the case brought that back to a grand jury and they have decided to move forward with an indictment. And of course, as we know, grand juries are always in secret. But of course, you always also sort of know because you can see that, you know, witnesses coming out of the rooms or what have you. And so, you know, somebody did see two witnesses at the courthouse, including crew members, one of whom was present at the time that the shot was fired and we know that Baldwin said he pulled back the hammer but not the yeah. trigger and uh, AP says defense attorneys for Baldwin have already indicated that uh, they will fight the charges. All right um, who are we going to next? Guy? I'm going to James Block this guy <laughs> no relation to Carson Block but he could be because he's an amateur sleuth as we're putting it on the Bloomberg today behind the best call of last year. Now he's a physician at one of America's top hospitals but that's not enough for him. During his spare time he moonlights as an amateur financial investigator and Writer, and he stumbled upon Signature Bank mm -hmm. right at the beginning of 2023. It took two months for Signature Bank to come down, but he had already had it in his sights two months earlier. His personal mission in general is to expose the cryptocurrency market, forget this, being what he describes 
a semi-decentralized pyramid scheme. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting. I mean, this guy's been on the radar of a lot of folks for a while. He's been very vocal. And it kind of harks back to, remember, you know, Roaring Kitty and GameStop, where you basically have folks who aren't necessarily financial professionals that are actually doing a lot of real fundamental analysis, trying to decide whether to buy or sell something. And he's obviously found, at least in his view, uh, some deficiencies uh, in the crypto space. And oftentimes yeah. with these people, you find that they don't make or profit as much as they could from their findings. So he said he had bet pennies or something on this on this idea. It was more that he wanted to, you know, propagate the idea. Yeah. And we know Hindenburg Research also, you know, at, at the time at least, yeah. made very little from the Adani enterprise yeah. Uh, drops. Yeah, he says it's just a hobby. But maybe now he's getting some attention. Maybe he'll, I mean, you know, I don't know. In between how, his shifts at the hospital? Yeah, I don't know. You know, being a physician or being, you know, an investor, I don't know. It's it's a, you know, you got to weigh it all out there. Both of them. Uh, let's get right to, to our third person here. Uh, maybe you're familiar with him. Paul Conway. Of course, a lot of people know him. He's the co-founder of the big investment company, Pacific Media Group. But he's also the owner of a Belgian soccer mm. club, Gosh. football, as you guys call it. And apparently you don't mess with Belgian soccer fans mm. because the upset here uh, with some of the changes that are being made and the buyout here, apparently they cornered this guy in a bathroom at the stadium. The I don't know what they wanted from him. Well, the, these people are, yeah. they're, I mean, we, we, you know, we may smile and so on, but these ultras, as they're called, they're serious. And I wouldn't want to be cornered in a bathroom full of steel and, you know, aluminum and all these hard products by 15 <laughs> ultras. And the funniest thing is that they call it the VIP section at KV Usten's game last weekend. Yeah. But I, part of the problem is that he's a multi-club owner and this is getting traction. He's a multi-club owner but can I just say the funniest thing about this story yeah. apparently this isn't the first time no. that soccer fans no. in Europe have trapped the owner in the bathroom. No. Apparently they did this to the owner of Manchester United. This is when the Glazers took it over uh, I think it was back in 07 and they said hundreds of people. It was like for five hours. What's like what's the going on over there? You have to can you do imagine if they did that here? <laughs> well you know if you wait there long enough I'm surprised on your stakeouts you haven't known this if you waited the bathroom long enough <laughs> the person will have to go. Alright we're going to get back to Mark it's in just a second as we count you down to the closing bells. 15 minutes away. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Bonnie Quinn. A record day here for the S&P 500, barring some dramatic turnaround over the next 10 minutes. It's really quite stunning, right? Remember the beginning of the week, it started off quite slowly. Yeah. A couple of down days, and of course, holiday-shortened trading week. Well, it's finishing on a note of a bullion, as you can see, up 1.2%, continuing to climb. This reminds me of the last session before the end of the year, actually, because that's exactly what happened that session as well. Uh, something going on today in the market, as you said, it's... Uh, Something that ground higher. Yeah. It was grinding all day. And I think a big a narrative that's going to unfold here over the next few weeks, too, is the disparity that we're seeing between what's going on in the U.S. markets and what's going on in the second largest economy. You see Chinese stocks, at least represented by the uh, Golden Dragon uh, Index there, only down six tenths of a percent. But on a weekly basis here, we're actually seeing one of the worst sell offs that we've seen in Chinese stocks in a while. It's been incredible. The amount of money that's come out of China just in the last few days, just since the beginning of the year. And some of it's on disappointment that she hasn't done more, that it's this drip, drip, drip of small things that's going to help the markets. But you did see some representatives at the World Economic Forum in Davos trying to put across the message that China is open for business. Well, it seems that the markets got the opposite message. Meanwhile, back here in the U.S., 48.36 right now on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq is actually your percentage gainer on the day, up about 1.6 percent. Ellen Lee joining us, Causeway Capital's management's portfolio manager, as we count down to the close with just about nine minutes to go. And Ellen, a lot of talk right now about this kind of a bit of a stealth rally, if you will. I mean, I know today is a strong day, but kind of the days that led up to this really didn't seem to belie the fact that we were going to end up at a record high. You buying into it? Not really, to be direct. Um, you know, in, in the current equity markets, if you look at the stock market, it's already pricing in a lower interest rate environment. However, if you look at the bond market, it's indicating that, you know, when rates have to fall, it's usually driven by some economic distress. So I think market's been very schizophrenic, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And um, the record level of valuation that's reflected in some of the equities, especially in S&P, yeah. is 
really, really astounding. Well, let me, let me just play devil's advocate for a second, because there are some people that have said that we're looking at valuation all wrong. That, yeah, if you just look at it from the historical perspective, yes, indeed, things are uh, overstretched here. But there are people, they look at structural changes, demographic changes, AI, things like that, and they say, at least for certain sectors, when you factor that in, some of these stocks might actually be cheap. Um, I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, so I, um, you know, admit that, you know, things could be different, but if you look at path cycles or technology breakthroughs, you know, changes actually take longer to adopt and impact tends to be uh, bigger. Mm -hmm. But even in AI, you know, we just started scratching the surface. I think when I talk to companies, they use the word a lot, but in terms of application, I think there's a varied spectrum of how it will actually be utilized. So I think we're still in the beginning. And if you look at at least the history of economic cycles and development, there hasn't been a change that you know makes me believe that historical patterns are going to be completely irrelevant. Hmm. Ellen, I know you're interested in certain international markets because their valuations are more attractive, but which ones? Because there may be a good reason for some of them trading at a discount. I mean, Europe may be going into recession. You know, there's all sorts of problems in certain countries in Asia. So I like the company Caring. Caring is um, a luxury goods company that owns brands like Gucci, Bottega, Veneta, and Saint Laurent. It's gone through a creative director change. Uh, management change at Gucci. They are a missed operating restructuring. Mm -hmm. And if you look at history of Gucci, they've turned around the company twice in the last couple of decades. So I know that the company is, or the brand is capable of reinventing itself. And secondly, the valuations re reflect the weakness, especially in China. So a lot of that is priced in under 15 times. So I believe that when the economic cycle turns, you know, Gucci will be a beneficiary as well as a huge beneficiary of operating restructuring. Yeah, that stock down 33% over the last year. I know Rolls Royce is another pick, but these are really luxury stocks, Ellen, and um, it seems like it might take a while for the Chinese consumer to come back, and luxury hasn't been doing so well. Yeah, luxury has been weak. Rolls Royce is actually an aircraft um, engine manufacturer. So they are actually in the midst, the beginning of uh, upcycle, where you know the uh, the wide body aircrafts are going back in the air, and flying hours are increasing. And Rolls Royce just had the new CEO come in the beginning of 2023, and their fruits of restructuring is coming to fruition. Since he's come into the office, they revised up their free cash flow guidance twice, and so with effects of operating restructuring. Combined with cyclical recovery, we believe the company is well positioned. It, it's up 240% in 2023, but we think we're still in the beginning phase. Uh, this gets a, a broader question here, uh, just about the general confidence that people have uh, in the markets and the economy, everything else all put together here. Does 2024, though, become a story where you really do have to be that kind of sing looking at single stocks or even single sectors, or do you think there will be a broader macro story that could sort of lift all boats or maybe sink them? depending on where so they go. Right, what we do at Causeway is look at companies on a bottom-up basis. And, you know, in the current environment, I think stock selection will really matter. And as I said, you know, because of COVID, a lot of sectors have a more asynchronous cycle. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, aircraft engineering is uh, aircraft engine manufacturing. That's going through an up cycle. Now, luxury goods has already gone through a downturn. So it's going to be really important to look at companies and sector specifically to make investments going forward. All right, Ellen. Well, I remember that's how it used to be done before we had that crazy bull run uh, a few years ago. Ellen Lee, always great. Uh, Causeway Capital Management helping us count down to the closing bells. Just about three minutes away from that here with the S&P 500 right now still sitting on those record highs, Vani. Yeah, it's incredible. And we haven't talked all that much about yields yet today, but I mean, obviously we will. And you're seeing sort of uh, the two-year yield a little bit more sensitive to how the Fed will perform, yeah. move a little more than the 10-year yield at the moment. But they're higher. They're very much higher. And uh, the two-year at 439, the 10-year at 413.98 right now. All right. Uh, we are, of course, uh, moving uh, closer uh, to those uh, closing bells. And we talk about this idea here, uh, Vani, uh, when we talk about sort of whether this does become sort of a macro driven market or, as I think Ellen has alluded to, and she's not the only one who's come on this program, talking about this idea of being bottom up focus, single stock focus, and that ends up being the driver here. 
But at the same time, you need an, econ uh, an economy to cooperate with that because those individual corporate fundamentals are still linked to the broader fundamentals of the exactly. economy. Exactly, and maybe more than one economy, right? Because the question in the United States is when the Fed eventually does cut, presuming it will cut for it as its first move, right? Is it because of slowing growth or is it because of inflation being well below its target or at yeah. its target for some time? And if it's because of growth, then, you know, I'm it's anyone's guess. Absolutely here. 4838 right now on the S&P 500. Looks like we are going to hit a record high for the S&P. Of course, the Dow also at a record high. So too is the NASDAQ 100. Our full market coverage starts as we take it to the Bell and Beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Bonnie Quinn. We're joined right now by our colleagues, Carol Masser and Tim Senevic, a global simulcast as we count you down to the bell and beyond. A hearty welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and YouTube. Record highs pretty much across the board here uh, today, Carol Masser, at least for the Dow, at least for the S&P, and of course for the NASDAQ 100 as well. Yeah, it's a big day, uh, certainly one for the bulls here. I was curious, you know, after that strong sentiment, U.S. sentiment, uh, consumer sentiment number this morning, I was curious about consumer discretionary names, and we're seeing some outperformance uh, and among the top gainers. The group overall just uh, up about 1.3% today. Okay, the question I have is if uh, companies can live up to the lofty expectations that investors have for them moving forward. And certainly we'll find out next week. We're in the midst of earnings season. We got a handful of big companies reporting next week, and then of course the week after as well. Uh, those include Tesla, a few airlines, uh, and Vani, and some of the uh, ever important railroads as well. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at the, you know, the the breakdown of what's higher, as Romain said earlier, semiconductor is really helping to a certain extent, up 4.4 percent as a group in the S&P 500. And uh, you know, things like managed healthcare, that after the Humana results, down two and a half percent. So some of this will hinge on how yeah. things perform next week. You know, the thing is, I mean, you have to kind of go back when you talk about the broader market here, and you go back to sort of what we saw uh, in late October, or sort of when stocks kind of bottomed out here. And the run-up that we've had in the major indices since then, it has been nothing a short of phenomenal. And of course, as we sit here at 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon on this very January 19th of 2024, we finally get the culmination of, I think, what a lot of people have said might have should have happened a long time ago. 48.39 and change on the S&P 500. It takes a while for these numbers to settle, but no matter where they settle, that will be a record high. A 60-point gain so or so on the day, 1.2% on the S&P 500. The other indices not to be left out. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up a percent to a record high. The NASDAQ Composite up about 1.7%. We should point out the NASDAQ 100 up about a similar amount at a record high. And the Russell 2000, let's take a quick look at that. Of course, that still has got a little bit of a ways to go before it gets back to a record high, but still posting a gain on the day of about 1%. Yeah, it's interesting. After kind of a tortured start, certainly on the equity side of things here in 2024, it does feel like as of late and certainly this week that, you know, investors are willing to take on uh, risk here when it comes to the trade. Having said that, Vani, S&P 500, a little bit of a deeper dive. We are definitely seeing that risk on trade. 371 names in the index, higher mm. today, 131 to the downside. Yeah, exactly, Carol. And as I mentioned, semiconductors and semiconductor equipment uh, representing many of those higher names, but also regional banks. It'll be a little bit of relief for some of those regionals uh, as they start to report earnings and so on to get some upside. Many of them are down 20% or more year over year. And then to the downside, as I was saying, managed healthcare not doing so well. And we also have a lot of the healthcare stocks actually uh, lower on higher medical costs. Just to reiterate, if you're just joining us, the S&P 500 folks closing at a record high for the first time in two years. So a significant move uh, certainly taken out uh, here on this Friday. All right, having said that, let's get to some of the individual gainers that were helping to push the overall market higher. This one, I've... I don't know if this has been on your radar. If it hasn't, it probably should be. Super micro uh, computer. I kind of pulled him over and I'm like, have you seen this stock? It has been year after year after year, uh, high performance, up 36% in today's session. Uh, it's up about 45%, I think, year to date, largely uh, because of the move uh, today. Last five years, since January 1 of 2019, it's up nearly 2,900%. It's a computer hardware maker. Uh, it put out some preliminary financial results. It beat expectations. The company saying expects to 
exceed its previous guidance. Analysts weighing in, including Barclays, uh, their analyst over there estimates that uh, Supermicro likely shipped 9,000 AI servers in the December quarter alone, thanks to improving graphics processing units, supply, and strong AI demand. They expect another full year 2024 guidance increase when Supermicro reports results later in this uh, right. later yeah. this month. I, is this a name that's on your radar? Oh yeah, it's been on our radar for a while. I mean, they're a big deal. I mean, at least if you're building the data center or something like that. But I mean, yeah, 35% seems uh, a little extreme, but I guess when you look at some of the valuations out there and the promise of AI, I guess maybe it makes sense. Yeah, exactly. But it's year after year after year. Uh, yeah. Just real quickly, PayPal, uh, a top gainer in the S&P 500, NASDAQ 100, up about 6%. No real news. A lot of volati volatility around this stock, a lot of analysts weighing in, yeah. but it was an outperformer today. And Endeavor, just wanted to mention, Group Holdings, up about 6.6% yeah. today. Um, you know, Romaine, your agents... Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, oh. we, we're not supposed to talk about that on air. You know, <laughs> I mean, my, don't worry. My feature film right. will I debut in 2025. Uh, but just real quickly, we yeah. should point out, too, I mean, in all seriousness, I, I mean, you talk about the moves that you saw in those tech names, you know, with Meta uh, basically going back to a record high, yeah. Microsoft going back to a record high. And in fact, most of those big cap tech stocks, and even some of the mid-tier ones like Supermicro, if not at a record high, now within a whisper of that as well. So this really has been, at least for this week, a real relatively broad base uplift. It has, but if we think about, you know, meta platforms, for example, or some of the other big tech names, it's certainly been a bumpy road getting here. I mean, that company uh, is up, what, about 70% since those lows about 18 months ago. And uh, they laid off a lot of people and did a lot of restructuring to, to get here. So it has certainly been a rough road. Hey, speaking of a rough road, there were some actually decliner, actual decliners in the S&P 500 today uh, and outside of the S&P 500 as well. I, I do want to start with one of the worst performers in the S&P 500, Albemarle. It is one of the largest lithium producers in the world. Uh, shares falling uh, for eight days in a row. Uh, it's down on the softness that we're seeing when it comes to the EV market. We saw the Ford news earlier today. We know what is happening when it comes to the way at least U.S. consumers are thinking about EVs. Um, the company's customers include car companies such as Ford, Tesla, Volkswagen, Mercedes, and more. And lithium, of course, a key component when it comes to those EV batteries. Uh, let's talk about PPG. Shares falling uh, in PPG industries today. It's the paint and coating maker. Reported yesterday its first quarter adjusted earnings per share um, came in below analyst estimates. Uh, Wall Street analysts also said the guidance implied a so slow start to the year. Shares finished then down by about 2.5%. And then did you guys see what happened to iRobot today? This is all a regulatory issue. Um, concerns that uh, the uh, Roomba maker, iRobot, uh, that Amazon acquisition domain expected to be blocked by Europeans, uh, European Union antitrust regulators over concerns that the deal will harm other robot vacuum makers uh, shares down. How, many, really? How many of those are there? That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I know there's like some knockoff ones. Yeah. We, have, uh, we have a knockoff ro a Roomba at home. Oh, yeah. Does it actually yeah. do the, does it only like it's, clean half the house the, or the, something? The, well, the Roombas yeah. are too expensive, so we got the cheaper I, one. I love this quote. EU interim competition chief Didier Reynard said Amazon had to pledge fair treatment to all robot vacuums <laughs> offered on its platforms. Uh, the the, the <laughs> antitrust regulators will not rest until the robot vacuums are all treated equally. Yeah. Uh, but in all seriousness, closing down 27%. And speaking of uh, competition, too, did you see Celsius? Uh, that's, of course, the big energy drink maker uh, down uh, significantly on the day. Worst day they've had in a year and a half. And that was on the back of a downgrade because of competition in the energy space. Uh, let's talk about yields because that was a big part of the story this week. It was a big part of the story last week. And in fact, what you're looking at right now it's kind of a complete reversal. Last week, you had a drop of about 23, 24 basis points on the two-year yield. This week, we had an increase of about 24 basis points huh. on the two-year yield. So call it a wash. You're looking at the daily numbers there here, up about three basis points on the two-year. The rest of the curve shifted slightly lower, but on a weekly basis, everything is higher than where it was. And that gets us to this idea here of whether that is going to actually factor into, well, how people look at today's rally when they come back, Carol, on Monday. Hey, and speaking of good news, uh, there's some good news for Mr. Uh, Gorman over at Morgan Stanley. We know he's moved out of the CEO role, uh, but James Gorman, uh, Morgan Stanley up in their pay, his pay specifically, 17.5% uh, to $37 million in his last year as CEO as that company. So um, certainly was at that company for a long time, made a lot of changes, but nonetheless, 2023 was a pretty good year for him. Okay, well, let's start thinking about what happens next week and then the week after, of course, when we hear from the Fed. We did hear from a lot of Fed speakers over the last two weeks. The blackout period begins 
next week. So we're not going to hear from Fed speakers next week. So we're okay. going to have to read different tea leaves. Um, but I think it's important that we're going to be hearing from a lot of different companies about the, any softness that they're seeing with the consumer. Again, I, I think that, you know, since we're seeing equity markets at all time highs for the first time in two years, it's going to be really important to hear if uh, investors' expectations are going to be met when, they, when we hear from some of these consumer companies. I think it's, I mean, when you look at at least the numbers that Bloomberg compiles in terms of expectations for earnings and aggregate here, they are relatively ambitious, if you will. The, most people seem to think that we are going to have a very good year overall. And if we start to see that in those fourth quarter numbers, and more importantly, the guidance that they give going forward, does that add more fuel to the rally or is that already priced in? Yeah, and I mean, every time we hear from a Fed speaker, as you pointed out, Tim, we have fresh data to sort of listen to them with. And uh, there was a raft of data this week, much of it good and much of it related to the consumer. How does that change each person, each voting member and each non-voting member's opinion on yeah. when they should cut first, Carol? Yeah, I think we're data dependent. We know that. We're going to yeah. go from data point to data point. Having said that, what happened with Ford today, we know that they're going through these changes. They're still committed to the EV market, but they've also got to stay true to the way you know cars have been for such a long time. Time. Take a look at that stock. What a range. It was down 1.5%, but finished up almost 2%. Range. I like what well, you did there. Thank you. <laughs> but I think the point is that companies react quickly to what is going on in the market, as much as it means really sorry for workers that lose their jobs, but I think they are kind of beaten up very quickly by the market if they don't do what yeah. they need to do. And somehow things cyclically kind of seem to move through pretty quickly. Just before you go, uh, Carol Master, and I know you've got a really busy Wait, day I ahead of you. I think we need to stop our mics and go. No, um, I think we have to that go. That $37 million on uh, Morgan Stanley for uh, Gorman. Yes. Interesting, too, they're also saying that Ted Pick, his starting salary, his base salary, that is, is going to be at 1.5. Obviously, that was pretty much in line with what Gorman made as a base salary. So the yeah. big question is, uh, are, is uh, is his uh, stock compensation going to rise to the same level that Gorman's did? That's maybe some weekend homework, huh, to think about that? Well, I mean, I just gave it to you now. <laughs> we got to go. Where are you going? Right. I don't know what I'm doing. This She's week, watching though. the game on Sunday. I am watching the game. Go Kansas City. Can I do that? All right. Um, that's a wrap, guys. Have a good and safe. I Kansas City fan. I thought you were from Jersey. I am. Uh, have but you heard of Taylor Swift? Are the Giants there? No. Um, all right, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good and safe weekend. Stay warm. All right, we'll see you guys, everybody, on Monday. All right, coming up, a closer look at AI right here on Bloomberg Television. This is on the back of a couple of Bloomberg scoops involving Sam Altman and his effort to raise money for a chip venture, something that we kind of knew about, and some departures over at Google's DeepMind project. That conversation coming up next on The Close on Bloomberg. Record high levels for U.S. stocks here on this Friday afternoon. And now a closer look here at compensation for some of the big bank CEOs. James Gorman, the outgoing CEO over at Morgan Stanley, already stepped down. His pay last year got bumped up by almost 18 percent to $37 million in terms of total compensation. Shanali Bassett standing by with a little bit more on this here. This is relatively in line with what we heard. I think we had you on yesterday, if I remember, uh, we talking about Jamie Dimon. He got $36 million in total comp. So James Gorman's right there in the mix. Right there in the mix. They yeah. call it the Morgan. The yeah. Morgan premium, isn't yeah. it? The, the jump you saw at J.P. Morgan was only about 4.3%. The jump you're seeing from Morgan Stanley is a lot larger. Of course, it was James Gorman's final year as CEO. What we also know is, you know, very kind of boilerplate here, the base salary also for the new CEO, Ted Pick, mm -hmm. according to this disclosure. But as we know, yeah. the base is nothing compared to the incentive. Yeah, the base incentive. is like peanuts for them, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's $1.5 million, yeah. a cool $1.5. Yeah. But, you know, you have this Morgan Stanley, $37 million. You have to remember that Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan commanded two of the richest valuations among every major Wall Street bank. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of $36, $37 million figure, it will be interesting to see how it sets the standards for others who do not trade as rich as Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan. All right, well, we'll find out. Shanali, thank you so much. That is Shanali Basak there, our crack finance reporter and host of Real Yield on Bloomberg TV. Spot Bitcoin ETFs began trading last Thursday, and since then, Bitcoin has slumped to its lowest since mid-December. Joining us now is David Mann, Franklin Templeton's head of ETF product and capital markets. Franklin Templeton launched their own Bitcoin ETF last week with the ticker EZBC. So, David, I have to ask you, are you disappointed? Uh, no, we've actually been really excited uh, from a new launch perspective, uh, really strong volumes. Uh, I know 
somewhat unprecedented in the ETF industry to have so many, uh, you know, so many funds starting with the same exposure. So certainly we're paying attention of our flows compared to the other issuers that brought a Bitcoin ETF, but uh, our volumes have been strong and we know that there's a lot of uh, platforms and gatekeepers that want to watch how these things work, make sure the trading's good, the creation redemptions works, that it's tracking the spot of Bitcoin. So uh, we know it's going to be a bit of a marathon and, and we're, we're excited about the journey. What's your pitch when you're trying to, you know, get grab some market share here? Is it purely fees? Is it the fact that you, you know, uh, use a different exchange? How do you convince an institution to, 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 to buy your Bitcoin ETF, frankly? Yeah, sure. So I would say there's two main two main pitches. First, uh, from a fee perspective, uh, we are currently the lowest uh, Bitcoin ETF in the marketplace. Uh, at 19 basis points with a fee waiver uh, down to zero for six months. Uh, but more importantly, just Franklin Templeton at, you know, we're now over 75 years um, uh, as an asset manager. Uh, we've been doing in the digital space for quite some time. And so the trusted partner and the digital expertise of our firm and, you know, actually uh, having an on-chain money market fund, actually investing in some of these companies, uh, actually being part of nodes and, and, and yeah. you know, at the forefront, you know, we're actually kind of a old school asset manager, but we're also crypto native. So combining that expertise and into, you know, my side, the ETF form, we think makes um, Franklin a good spot for your Bitcoin investments. I am curious as to the, uh, whether you think that the folks who will gravitate to say, uh, someone like your company, Franklin Templeton, versus some of the more, I guess, pure sort of newer crypto players, whether it's Coinbase or whoever else is going to be doing custody out there. Do you think that there will be sort of a preference by some of the folks to go for sort of, the, I guess, newer finance companies at the expense of the more traditional of finance companies like Franklin Templeton? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, we're, we're wondering that sometimes ourselves. I mean, in terms of Franklin Templeton, there's a, okay, the crypto native and the old school asset manager. And so, you know, to your point, uh, this is a Bitcoin exposure with an ETF form. So sort of the obvious first answer is, well, are we going to be talking to folks who like to use ETFs? So that's maybe the tr traditional asset allocators, traditional platforms. And now there's this whole new uh, crypto natives and folks that have had digital wallets that um, are now maybe that thinking they'd rather have it in a, in a brokerage account. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're talking to all of them, but, but um, it's, it's, it's an interesting journey uh, to see, yeah. you know, where all what? these dollars are going to be coming from. And especially looking at the first, uh, you know, first trading over the last week, week and a half, yeah. how much is moving from an existing exposure, whether it was other fund vehicles or even just Bitcoins into these ETFs um, uh, is something we're tracking. Absolutely. And it's going to take a little more time, I guess, for all this to shake out, of course, as uh, this stuff has to kind of work its way through the system, particularly when you're talking about new adopters. I am curious about on the custodian side, uh, particularly what types of conversation you guys had about the difference in custody of digital assets versus custody of just, you know, normal, you know, say stocks and bonds here. Is there a material difference there or are, is there enough, I guess, overlap and synergy there that it doesn't really matter? Uh, no, it's 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 uh, we get a lot of those questions. Um, you know, where are the bitcoins um, held? Ours is uh, we use Coinbase as our uh, Bitcoin custodian. Um, you know, depending on how far down the ETF ecosystem rabbit hole you want to go, we can talk about hot and cold wallets. We can talk about creations and redemptions. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, we'll use gold as an analogy in terms of um, okay, well, how does mm. the fund hold gold, and who's your gold custodian? Considering yeah. that bitcoins often often referred to as digital gold. Um, lots of new plumbing was built, but at the, at, at the end of the day, um, a lot of the features that investors have come to like about ETFs, the trading and liquidity, um, you know, trading in line with the uh, value of Bitcoin, kind of works the, the same as, uh, as uh, other ETFs. Correct me if I'm wrong, it looks to me that your market cap right now, and obviously we're in the very early days, is $48 million. Is there a baseline market cap that you would need in order for this ETF to continue living? Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, to my earlier point, um, you know, we, we certainly model out how we think flows will go one in three and five years. But, um, you know, given that a lot of the major partners and platforms that we tip, typically talk with will tell us, Hey, this is this is a bit new. We're still thinking through what is the right percentage of asset allocation that should go to Bitcoin. 
we're going to watch how these behave for one, two, three months, and then um, and then you know we'll be admitted to those platforms, so to speak. So um, we are, you know, we've priced this with a long-term um, horizon, and so we've got plenty of runway to uh, to get there. All right, David, great to catch up with you. David Mann over at Franklin T Templeton. A closer look here at the nascent uh, spot Bitcoin ETF market here. And, of course, uh, the big players now trying to make their mark. Coming up here, a closer look at venture capital and a closer look at the video gaming industry. There's, they're, of course, connected, and there's been an interesting development here when it comes to some of the M&A activity in that space. Josh Chapman of Convoy Ventures is going to be joining us in just a bit. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's talk video gaming or just gaming because funding in the sector is on a bit of a downbeat. Valuations dipping by about 33% between the third and the fourth quarter, though I'm told actual volumes are pretty much in line with where they were the previous quarter. Josh Chapman knows a lot about this industry. He's a managing partner over at Convoy Ventures, and he joins us now to talk a little bit more about this. And before we get down uh, into the nitty gritty and some of the broader trends, I am curious about the discrepancy between the drop uh, in deal values that we saw last year. But when I was looking at the number of deals, they were about the same. Yes. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me on the show. But the, that drop is direct, directly correlated to the fact that valuations have come down, and so the amount of funding that's going into gaming has actually dropped, but the valuations kind of allow you to have the similar ownership. Uh, and so the volume stays consistent because seed and early stage are doing well, but that's, that's why you're seeing that discrepancy in the market. So where do we look to, I guess, in 2024? Because whenever we talk about this sector, I think everyone kind of focuses on uh, that handful of publicly traded big companies out there. But there's a whole universe yeah. of other names out there. And I'm wondering how much appetite is there out there by for, in for investors to chase after some of those yeah. names? Last three or four years, there's been about 30 to 40 billion dollars that's been put into the video gaming industry and a bunch of names that have yet to go IPO or names that are actually being publicly traded. And so that's kind of the main thing that everyone's waiting for is where's the liquidity coming in the market for that 30 to 40 billion dollars. A few names like that are waiting to go public are things like Epic Games that owns Fortnite or Discord. Uh, um, a lot of other different companies that are still private. And so that kind of goes into the IPO backlog that's a more broader macro trend. But over the coming years, we're going to watch these names potentially go public. We're going to watch public corps mm -hmm. potentially use their $32 billion on the balance sheet in cash to buy private companies for half a billion, a billion, two billion. Uh, and we're even seeing non-endemics like Savvy Gaming Group out of Saudi Arabia put over $30 billion into gaming, uh, of which they did a $5 billion acquisition just last year. So mm. I think you're going to see a lot of new entrants, public courts buying private companies, and then the IPO backlog finally go public once Have it's ready. Have some of them, though, Josh, missed their opportunity? Because it does feel like, if I can phrase it this way, there's a bit of a gaming recession on. Gamers are dropping off, and particularly Twitch watchers. Yes. Actually, I would disagree with you that gamers are dropping off. Last year, we just added 100 million gamers to the gaming ecosystem. So now 3.3 billion gamers in the world are playing. That's adding about 100 million a year, and that's been steady for almost two decades. That's really interesting where the gamers are still increasing, but the industry is seeing sort of this dip in funding that's very correlated to the fact that this is a very risk on sort of venture capital gaming trade when rates are rising and you can get risk off capital uh, gains elsewhere. And so that I think this macro environment is affecting early stage bets while the gaming industry continues to see adoption. You see Netflix gaming continuing to rise. You see uh, groups like Nintendo continue to come out with you know their next version and console. And so I think gaming's thriving underneath, but the industry from a funding and a revenue basis is sort of fluctuating along the way. What about the content? Are people getting as excited for games coming out now or you know, are the next iterations of all these games just a bit like the television you know, movie series that are franchised that are just getting a little bit you know, long in the tooth? 
Yeah, I think people are still excited about certain games that they have a lot of brand loyalty to. So if you're a huge Halo fan, you're really excited about that, but you don't really care about Grand Theft Auto. On the other side, Take-Two Interactive that owns Grand Theft Auto, their upcoming you know, uh, GTA 6 is one of the most anticipated games uh, for decades. Then you have things like Call of Duty that people buy habitually every couple of years. And so it really depends by the game that people are playing, where their loyalties and therefore their wallets uh, will follow. Um, but I think as a broader statement, and this is sort of a, a personal view that we have at the firm, there are too many games in the gaming industry, and there probably needs to be a lot more consolidation of talent building better games, but a few fewer than before. And I think that's a trend we're going to see right now as you're going through sort of a, a lot of that pain in tech, a lot of uh, consolidation, business models that are a little upside down. I think you're going to see people band together to yeah. build greater experiences, but just fewer of them. Okay, so fewer of them. So that means don't necessarily expect big IPOs, but expect maybe more consolidation? Yeah, I think this year you're going to see no huge gaming vertical M&A. So if last year the big story was obviously Microsoft buying Activision, one of the largest uh, acquisitions of all time in tech. And that was huge for the gaming industry and one we were very supportive of and we're so glad that got through. Yeah. That said, the regulatory environment, I think, is going to hold back some more of those big IPOs this year. You just saw Adobe Figma fall apart. So yeah. I think that's happening on the M&A side. I don't expect a lot of gaming IPOs to happen this year. Anything above 500 million, I don't think happens this year because yes. um, a, a host of reasons of which you all are experts in monitoring on a daily basis. Yes. So yeah. that's sort of my, my prediction on that Josh, side. Thank you so much. We will let you get back to playing Fortnite. <laughs> we know that's your thank favorite you game. Thank you so much. Josh Chapman, managing partner at Convoy Ventures there joining us. Coming up, we'll speak to the brains behind New York City's first cannabis concept store. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. This is that part of the show where we tell you how the markets did on the day and on the week. And guess what? They did well. You're looking at a record high on the S&P 500. 515 days had passed from the last record high back in early January of 2022. A lot of folks said that it was overdue, long overdue, but still a lot of big questions here about whether the corporate fundamentals are going to support that big rally that we've seen. Off of those October lows, back to 4,800 and change, 1.2% here on the day, and now it's firmly above a lot of those key moving averages. We should point out the Dow also closed at a record high today. So did the Nasdaq. NASDAQ 100, the Russell 2000, as well as the NASDAQ Composite they have some catching up to do. But there are a lot of investors right now that think when you look at the interest rate environment, when you look at the Fed, and more importantly, when you look at the economic data, there is a case to be made. The valuations in this market are not only cheap, but for some of them, a screaming buy. It's fine. All right, we want to pivot from this and go to our next up segment. This is where we highlight the entrepreneurs and trendsetters moving the needle in the markets and in technology and in venture capital space. Our next guest has been merging her experience in the VC state with retail and cannabis. Opening Gotham is New York City's first cannabis concept store, and it promises buyers the state's best cannabis alongside other premium items. Please to say, Joanne Wilson is joining us here right now, the founder and CEO of Gotham. Uh, Joanne, why cannabis? You've had a lot of businesses prior to this. Why cannabis? Why not? <laughs> um, I think it's a multiple things. Uh, as after in the pre during the COVID world, seeing all these different stores collapse, as well as um, the advent of cannabis coming into a very very early stage nascent market, I think is really what inspired me to get involved. But you know, it's a really really difficult space, particularly if you're going into it legally, right? So if you want a license, you, that takes forever, and obviously you have one, so you went through all that process. So this has to have been a multi-year process for you. How much did it cost to get up on your feet? It costs millions of dollars to get up on your feet and the taxes, um, there's a tax called 280E which is extremely um, uh, egregious in regards to what you need to pay the federal government so we're all waiting on bated breath for that to change through the DEA that will hopefully change the tax situation but 
it is an insanely complicated business, particularly you're talking about an industry that has never been um, legal, um, but has been operating fine and nandy for 60 years. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Now, New York City licensed about 16 dispensaries last year, but we uh, all know, I mean, there's probably 16 on most blocks in New York City, right? So does it actually affect your business that all these unlicensed premises are open? It absolutely affects our business. I mean, when people say, what is the most, what is the thing that you expected that you didn't expect? Well, I did not expect there would be 8,000 illegal stores in New York City and they would be my biggest competitors. I mean, the reality is, is these illegal stores run the market in New York City. And um, I know that the state is working really hard and figuring out how to shut them down, but it's a tremendous problem and I don't think a lot of the consumers even know that these stores are illegal. And that, to me, is the biggest problem. Uh, there's a million ways to make customers aware. PSAs would be the first, um, but there's very little tax money that the state has um, created because they haven't opened up another store. So it's sort of this catch-22. Uh, there's clearly a failure here on the part of government to address this. And again, anyone who's not in New York, uh, I, I really encourage them to just walk the streets and you'll see exactly what we mean by the proliferation of these stores. Oh, it's crazy. In, in the meantime, though, <laughs> you've still got to run a business, right? you got to run so a business. So what what's the value proposition? where people come to your store and buy legally instead of going to either these illegal stores or to their old illegal dealers. Uh on the streets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, listen, we created a very unique store. I think that the when I sought out to do this, I wanted to change the narrative around cannabis. And this narrative around cannabis has been false um, since uh, the person that oversaw the Alcohol Commission back in the 1930s keeping their job, and they really use it to keep black and brown people in jail. Yeah. And so the reality is, is that there's nothing wrong with cannabis. You can point to Israel that's continued to do all the research on it and allow that to happen, whereas in our country, we've stopped all that research. Every day, there's new things that are coming out. and so. You know, it is a lifestyle. It's just like, why can't you, you can go into a wine store and have cheese and crackers and bring mm -hmm. in your kid. Why wouldn't you want to go to a cannabis store and experience something very similar? Mm -hmm. I mean, ask around. Yeah. Everyone's using cannabis. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll plead the fifth on that, but uh, you may or <laughs> may not be correct. I, I, am, I am curious, though, uh, as to how you build this business beyond just having one store, if that is indeed your ambition. How do you do that? Well, I mean, I came out of the startup world. I was in technology startups as an angel investor for way over a decade. I invested in over 150 stores. I've built stores, companies before, mm -hmm. and we're looking at this as but a startup. But have you ever built something where you, where you were immediately faced with that level of competition? Can't say I've ever built yeah. something that I had to deal with the government before at this level. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's the same thing. You know, you're building a brand. You're building a direct-to-consumer business with our merchandising. We're looking to build our delivery business. You can go to Gotham.nyc and get anything delivered around the city and then we also have these experiences in our store of which we do events all the time that creates community and people come back and constantly for that. So I think that's a really important, particularly in this post-COVID world. Yeah, there you go. I was going to ask you about that because it's, it's, to some extent it's a little bit of a commodity, right? I mean, it's like a coffee shop, but there are some coffee shops that are more popular than others. So there's obviously things that work and things that don't. What have you found that works? And, you know, as a side question, what do people want the most? It depends on the customer. We have everything for everyone. I do think that what sets us apart, we're a very high-tech, uh, high-touch business, high uh, very um, luxury hospitality. I think that's what most customers are looking for. They feel comfortable in a store. They like what they're seeing. The people behind the, um, the case lines, the bud tenders know deep knowledge about what works for you or what doesn't work for you. And so once you become a customer, I mean, the numbers and the data prove that you continue to come back to Gotham. There will be stores all over this city that will eventually be like your local dry cleaner or mm -hmm. your local shoes person or your local bodega, yeah. but we aren't that. Okay, but that's where the differentiating comes that's in. That's where the but differentiating comes because, in. Particularly because, as I'm sure you know, a lot of the products, but primarily because of the regulation, are the same. If I go to one store, a lot of times the, the other legal store will have kind of the same brands and the same inventory uh, for the most part. So you have to separate yourself out. We talk about it from the customer's perspective. I am curious about when we talk about scaling up and maybe the need for investors. Mm -hmm. Are investors overall comfortable coming into this space given some of those loose ends around regulation and, le and legalization? There's no investors in this space. Hmm. There's no investors in space. And think that all of these 
people that have been previously incarcerated that got this golden ticket to go out and open a store that they're going to make millions of dollars, they are going to be sorely sad to find out that it's not going to work. Investors are not going to give to individuals. What investors will give to is brands that are being built, that are being profitable, that can figure out how to open across state lines in different states, working with different farmers. That's an interesting investment. Or the large companies that are on the public markets, that's investing. Or back-end technology. But they're, these one-offs, they're never getting money. And the banks certainly aren't giving it to them. All right, Joanne. Well, this is illuminating. We have to have you back on to talk mm -hmm. about this. Uh, Joanne Wilson, uh, prolific uh, investor and entrepreneur, now the founder and CEO of Gotham. Funny. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman has been working to raise billions for a chip venture with the aim to set up a network of factories to manufacture AI semiconductors. Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow joins now with the story. So, Ed, give us the context here. Tell us a little more. Yes, yeah, so Sam Altman basically wants to guarantee for OpenAI the future supply of chips used in, in AI. And, and right now, we're talking about AI accelerators that are used principally in the training of large language models. But in the future, when all of those large language models are deployed in the real world, either as generative AI tools or other AI technology, it's about kind of the, the constant running of them, the inference side of this equation. So all sorts of investors around the world are very keen to write checks to Sam Altman. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars. But what he wants to do is, in partnership with the existing chip contract manufacturers, make sure that we are building the additional capacity, literally new chip fabs or chip factories, that can help him work towards that long-term goal. Just clear up something for me, Ed. I mean, are we talking, yeah. when we talk about his chip venture, are we talking about more about design or, or the actual build? Because it seems like the expertise he would need to do this, he's still going to have to partner with, I, I don't know, a, a TSMC or an Intel or somebody else, right? Or, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. No, th this is exactly why we went and reported this today, because it gives clarification that the initiative, and it's an initiative, right? Sam Altman has a lot of ideas. There are lots of people that want to invest in him. But he's basically trying to bring many parties together, saying, I'm really worried that we won't have supply in the future that meets the demand. And so what can I do as a kind of spearhead of this project to do that? As it stands, the focus is not on designing a specific AI accelerator uh, that would compete with NVIDIA's H100 or AMD's MI300X, though I suspect that that is something that Sam Altman has thought about based on what I'm hearing from sources. All right. So uh, there's another uh, story that we had a little bit earlier uh, involving a couple of uh, folks over at Google DeepMind who are also leaving that company, that project, to start their own. What do we know about that, Ed? Yeah, so two of their leading scientists are raising 200 million euros, according to sources, for a new AI startup. And, you know, it's not uncommon for talent to move between AI companies. If you look at, like, names like Anthropic or you look at um, Mistral, you look at OpenAI, many of the people on staff at all those companies have spent time at somewhere else. But for me, the story here is that there is still a lot of throth and enthusiasm that investors would be willing to hand over that sum of money, be it a, a seed round or a Series A, the first time that a startup's raising money, if they're bringing in 200 million euros, it's a big chunk of change. Um, and the market seems to still be there for it. This appetite to get into new AI startups based on people with long-standing careers, either on the academic side or the R&D side. There you go. I mean, Google DeepMind is a pretty good thing to put on your resume. But Ed, the people who are familiar with the matter said that the venture may be focused on building a new AI model. What does that mean, just using different large language models? Yeah, look, uh, there are lots of companies that are working on large language models. You can differentiate a large language model by the volume of parameters on which it's trained. In other words, the volume of data and how many different data sets you use to train it. You can train a very narrow large language model with fewer parameters that has a much more specific focus. Um, this is not what we know about in this case, but you could train a large language model uh, solely on DNA data, for example, because you want to use that use case of automating or accelerating your ability to uh, read uh, the human genome, as an example. Uh, there are lots of people doing it different ways. What they all have in common is that it's expensive to do uh, because you need a lot of compute, but you also need the computer science talent to write the underlying code for it. Hence, why two hundred million dollars isn't a huge uh, euro. Sorry, is not a huge surprise for a, for a two-person operation at this stage. 
Some amazing stories from our San Francisco team today. Thanks to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow for joining us. Coming up, we'll hear from Blair Efron, Centipede Partners co-founder and partner, about his 2024 election expectations for Wall Street. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. David Weston, the host of Wall Street Week, joins us as he does every day. And David, uh, we had a big uh, day, at least Trump had a big day in the Iowa caucuses. <laughs> yeah. We have the New Hampshire primaries uh, next week. And maybe we'll get a, bit, a little bit more clarity as to who's really going to be facing off, though. Kind of seems like inevitable who the two candidates well, let's are. We be. don't know yet, but yeah. as you suggest, I mean, right now, yeah. if you're going to guess, it looks like it's going to be the current president and the former president, mm -hmm. Steve Gradoff. And we're trying to do something on Wall Street Week called uh, Wall Street Votes, where we basically ask, what does it mean for Wall Street between these two candidates? If we end up there, what do their policies mean? So we talked to Blair Efron. As you know, he's an investment banker, Center View Partners co founder and partner. He also has been really active in democratic politics. So you'll see that he has some points of view. But we asked him from Wall Street's point of view, from the CEOs he talks to, what is the difference between these two sets of economic policies? For the first time in history, we have uh, two candidates that have been president. So you have a track record of what they of, uh, uh, what to expect. In the case of uh, President Biden, you've had so far three years of steadiness, good growth, markets at an all-time high. Um, I think it's underappreciated what has gone on with the economy. Uh, Unemployment at 3.7 percent uh, versus the Trump years at 4 percent. Job creation, if you take out COVID as the impact, you still have 9 million jobs created under President Biden versus 6 million under President Trump. Um, and even GDP growth, uh, a, few point, a few basis points higher under uh, President Biden. So um, in addition to that, you've had a re-engagement uh, globally. And um, when you think about our biggest and best companies, 60% of their business is outside the country, outside the U.S. Therefore, having a, uh, an important, steady relationship with allies and adversaries, um, where you're protecting U.S. interests, but also uh, looking out for the interests of uh, corporate America, um, I think does matter. And I think if you think, uh, look at the policies ahead, what do you expect in a second term? I think with uh, a Joe Biden, you still have, uh, out of the three trillion of investment spend, there's five trillion of total spend, but th only three trillion towards investment, infrastructure, CHIPS Act, IRA. 75% uh, of that is still available to be spent. So you will get that spent. You'll have 900 billion has already been spent um, by the private sector, capital, in terms of uh, uh, support behind IRA. For example, uh, uh, carbon sequestration facility. Uh, by Exxon down in uh, uh, the Gulf Coast, everything in Ohio around chips. You'll see more of that. Uh, I also think you will see uh, policies aimed towards um, lowering costs for all Americans. You saw the first term, drug pricing insulin. In the second term, expect more around child care, uh, uh, long-term care benefits, uh, more around drug pricing. And um, continued engagement globally. So then the question is, uh, with the Trump presidency, what do we know so far? Well, what about that? Because if you look back, I think a lot of Wall Street says, it was not a bad time under President Trump, in fact. Uh, we, we actually had good growth. We had good job creation, uh, less regulation, less taxation. A lot of companies did pretty well, didn't they? The companies did well, and they continue to do well. And I think that people need to appreciate that uh, our private sector is as innovative and vibrant as ever. Um, but even this regu regulatory question, everybody talks about my world, M&A. Um, fact is, for the uh, first three years of uh, President Biden versus three years of President Trump, m and is up 6%. Um, in terms of policy, what we've heard so far, and the, the thing that I'm particularly focused on is the notion of tariffs, 10% mm. um, uh, tariff across the board. And that, to me, is a tax on Americans. That's $300 billion of uh, increased cost to Americans. That's inflationary. It's uh, estimates you've seen by independent analysts have 500,000 jobs at risk and uh, probably a point or so less GDP growth. So that, that's concerning. And um, in addition to that, the question of budgets. I think it's important to 
either candidate that we uh, rein in uh, our deficit. And if we let uh, uh, the tax cuts uh, put through uh, under the Trump administration continue, that's another three and a half trillion dollars to the deficit. And I think it's very important in this environment to do that. One more thing I'd point out. Um, we've had a high interest rate environment. And the fact that we are still able to have a tailwind for the economy is a testament to uh, uh, the innovation and talent uh, of our companies, both small business, which is half of our economy, and the most important biggest companies on the other side of the spectrum. So um, under Trump, we had um, basically free money. And I think it's added a certain discipline. So when we talk about growth, it's actually even more impressive that you can grow in the current in the current environment. You mentioned the debt and deficits. How concerned is the C-suite, sort of generalizing here, but how concerned is the C-suite about debt and deficit? Because when you talk about the tariff issues, there are clearly issues about how we would conduct ourselves in the world at the same time. Even the Committee for Responsible Federal uh, Budget says that, in fact, it would reduce the deficit because it would be money coming to the coffers of the U.S. government. So, first of all, the deficit... Um, is as important an issue as everybody thinks it is. You never know when it hits you. Um, it's either cancer or it's a heart attack, and at some <laughs> point we will be reacting to it. I would tell you that uh, uh, no matter who is president, that must be dealt with. In the case of President Biden, obviously the IRA, uh, there's a reason for Inflation Reduction Act, um, has a deficit component in there, bring down deficit $300 billion. And uh, I do think that... Um, the strength of this country depends on uh, the strength of the dollar, depends on capital inflows, um, depends on the sanctity of uh, our budgetary process, and that all says we need to be uh, focused on the debt before it starts focusing on us. That was Blair Efron of Centerview Partners. And I must say, that last issue about the debt and the deficit, yeah. one of the things Glenn Hubbard told us last week for Wall Street Votes is mm. he's worried there isn't enough of a difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump because it's not clear that either one of them is really going to take that on. Yeah, and it, but it also where's the support? I mean, no, even if even if one exactly. of the presidents did decide, decide to spearhead that, are you really going to be able to corral what is still a very divided Congress in order to get it done? Yeah, and I'm not sure the American people really are clamoring for more taxes or less spending. And I thought his analogy, kind of comparing it to, we'll address it when it gets to kind of heart attack yeah, level. Yeah. And that's what a lot of economists have said, right? It just that's just kind of how we operate, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately, as a country, is that we wait to the last possible minute when things are really dire to finally say, let's address this as a nation. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And tonight on Wall Street Week, we're going to be joined by Lawrence H. Summers. He's the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, as well as Afsane Beshlas, Rock Creek CEO, and Peter Borsch, computer trading company. That's at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Romain. All right, Wall Street Week coming up in just a bit here. Stick with us here on the close. We're going to set you up for some of the big market-moving events over the next week. This is Bloomberg. Some breaking news, JetBlue and Spirit have filed an appeal on that ruling that blocked the merger deal. Remember earlier this week, a judge basically said that deal could not go through. We have now learned that JetBlue and Spirit are now filing an appeal to us hopefully shepherd that merger forward. All right, that could be a potential big market moving event deeper into the future. As for next week, there is a lot going on, including earnings. Exactly, and from across the spectrum, Romain, quite literally, we have Verizon and AT&T, but also from other industries, American Express, Tesla, and so on. And Netflix as well. Also some economic data as well, including uh, some PMI data as well as jobless claims. Exactly, all the PMIs, and then investors have to wait till Friday before they get the crucial PCE data. We also get some central bank decisions, not the Fed, but some big ones big as well. Big ones, yeah. CB, BOJ, BOC, none of them are expected to move. It's all their first meeting of the year, but they will say interesting things. And then, of course, back here uh, in U.S. politics, we're going to get a sort of another look at who the potential nominee for the Republican Party could be. Of course, Trump won the Iowa caucus by a huge margin, the New Hampshire primary next Tuesday. And that will be on TV and radio right here on Zoom. Yeah, we'll have full coverage here. Our Balance of Power team will be all over that. I'll be back next week. Please tune in then. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.